Hello and welcome back to my channel, Deku Fanfic. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the seventh part of our series, What If Deku Mastered OFA in His Own Quirk. If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Han Baron from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. No POV. I have to say this is an odd place for me to be. But given the current state of the world, it would be the best place for me to make my mark. Manla thought while reclining in Sasaku's penthouse. He rubbed the edges of a grimoire his mother had shown him as a boy. But it was different from then to now. When she first showed it to him, it was pristine. Now, the outside cover was splattered with blood. He looked down at it with frustration and anger. Most of it at the fact the book could not protect his family from those who sought to destroy the old ways that his father practiced or hated his mother for being different and learning about other magics. They think their science and quirks give them right to stand above all others, to denounce if one believes otherwise. Well, they'll feel how the old ways can strike back. Manla thought once more before remembering how Sasaku and Tamira had found him. Ugh, it's really humid around here. Tamira complained as they walked out of the Cape Town airport. Natalie agreed but knew they had to put up with it to find who they were looking for. She holds up a device we made to help them track the energy they were looking for. She hums a bit before saying they needed to get out of the city. If this device is correct, and I assume it is, then our quarry is close to the sea. I think near the Cape Floral, whatever it is, Sasaku says with some confusion. They take a bus out to the area and start investigating. They found nothing for over an hour, but they started to notice an odd pattern. When they tried to get close to an area near the coast itself, they felt as though they were turned back or were suddenly dropped in a place far from the area. He's intentionally sending us away, or somehow teleporting, mind controlling us to where we won't get close. Sasaku says after being turned around for the twelfth time. Shigaraki was annoyed but he respected whoever this was that was keeping them away. He hums before suggesting they wait till night. He may have this up just during the day. Good way to keep others away, but there is probably no reason for it at night. Tamura reasons. You may be right. We just have to be patient. Natalie says as they hide among some plants to wait for their moment. When evening fell, they made their way toward the coast and eventually found a hut by the sea. And they were promptly captured by plants and a strange energy. When they tried to use their powers, they suddenly felt numb from a mist that was spreading through the air. You have been investigating my home area for the entire day. Why? Manla demanded before saying a prayer in Zulu that summoned spiritual warriors. Both were a bit nervous before Tamira mentioned that they were interested in his abilities. And we were hoping to add you to our party, in a way to take down this society and all the fools with it. Manla eyed them with suspicion, but he was willing to hear them out. He pulled out his grimoire and cast a spell from it to make a pair of golems. He released the two from the plants and mystic energy before having the golems bring them. Once inside his hut, he asked what they had in mind and what they were really after. Tamira and Sasaku shared looks before talking about their experiences and what they had endured. It seemed to resonate with the young mystic as he talked of his parents. His father a traditional mystic and shaman of his people, and his mother a collector of antiquities and objects that seemed associated with magic. Even if they didn't have magic she found the study of it curious and interesting. But many others disliked and despised them. My father for his adherence to old way they all believed didn't exist and my mother they saw as a witch, Manla says while rubbing the grimoire from his mother. He said he hated quirks and the society built around them, but he couldn't really fight against the sheer number of those with quirks. Maybe with us you can. We can give you the chance to really take revenge against those who took your parents, and many more beyond that, Sasaku says with a sad look directed the young mystic's way. Tamira finishes with, but it has to start back in my home nation. Japan has become the forefront of heroics, powers, and quirks once again, partially thanks to All Might, but also thanks to some hero wannabes from UA. If we can show them to be weak, we can make those heroes and others in this society tear themselves apart. Manla looks at them with a bit of suspicion, but he does like the idea of some form of payback. He sighs before mixing up some of his herbs to negate the poison mist he created. He helps the two villains drink a bit before it negates the toxins. I'm willing to listen. For now. And that listening brought me here. We can make a move soon. And I can make some use of the local plants to make some very interesting concoctions. But I need time. Manla thinks before casting some spells from the book, as well as attempting his prayers to summon ancestral warriors. Wu is uneasy about working with an energy he doesn't understand and an ally he isn't sure would be willing to work with them. Doc, I get why you're uneasy. But this guy might be able to do a lot for us. Jin says with a wary eye at the newest member. I'm just not sure about how far or long we could trust him. Wu says before turning back to his lab. But Manla heard all of what they said and had his own point on the matter. I don't blame you, but I've been hurt by those with quirks and those who disliked me and my family for being different. I'd say that is enough to compare with you, no. Wu looks back in the African descent man and considers some of what he said. He doesn't disagree and admits it is comparable to what he endured with Deternat. And it does make sense on why you'd want revenge and to ally with us. But, I'll just admit it, the idea of magic goes against my principles as a scientist. Wu says with a suspicious look directed Manla's way. 
who just rolls his eyes and closes his grimoire with a snap before saying he'd have to get used to it. The newest member then excuses himself to work with some materials and research a few more spells. Natalie and Tamira observe from the side and let out a pair of sighs. I suppose it would be a bit too much to expect them to all get along. Yeah, it's not like they all have the same experiences or motivations when it comes to why they fight. Well, we'll just have to wait and see what happens, A eh, Tavarish? The two leaders had been sipping some coffee while discussing. And as much as he wanted to deny her calling him a friend, Tamira couldn't help but smile a bit at Natalie referring to him as such. So, he agreed and held up his mug for an impromptu toast. While the villains were preparing for their next set of actions against the heroes, the classes of UA were preparing themselves. Some were anticipating the upcoming school festival and the greater chance to shine. Even if it was over a month and a half or so away. But the hero classes were having a different issue. At least the first year ones were. Many of them were still recovering after strenuous assignments or contemplating how they could apply their newly learned skills with their quirks. Others, though, were considering asking Jotaro and Safentite to teach them about Kai as well as other martial arts. Most were turned away, though. You don't have what you really need to try and learn these skills. So, there is no point in teaching you, Jotaro said a bit coldly. While a few from his class complained about this, Aizawa agreed with him. Most of you are just looking at him as a flashy way to be a hero, or have other shallow reasons, and that won't help you. The teacher's own cold look told them that he wouldn't teach them either. Ajiro was one who had considered asking to learn Kai. But hearing the way they described it, he started to think over the reasons why they were refusing. While ones like Minda and Kaminari were looking for ways to look cool since their quirks were lame or had a big drawback. With the main two who were learning Kai, there had been some progress made. Itsuka couldn't launch a wave or blast a long distance like Jutero could. But she had finally put together how to make it move from her and maintain the form. Ken no Nami. Itsuka shouted as she made two blade arcs in front of her. They only went about six inches before dissipating, but it was progress. The redhead breathed deep before saying, Man, I still can't make it go farther. And I've tried using the storm fist but that doesn't work either. Safentite just told her to be patient before suggesting she takes a break. It takes time to properly release Kai like that. It took Jotaro years before he could do more than unleash a short-range shockwave, the genie girl explains. With Jotaro, he decided to take Aizawa's training a different way. I've thought about this before, but you do employ a bit of ninjutsu technique in your style. The problem is, other aspects are ignored due to your reliance on your quirk. I won't deny that. My style is best as an ambush type and I do my best work at night and underground. But I have work to get around that. Aizawa admits as they were walking to an area Jotaro suggested. The boy though smirked at him before disappearing when the hero teacher blinked. Aizawa was shocked and looked around to try and find him. How can someone that big disappear? He thought aloud while looking between the trees and rocks in the battle area. Size isn't the determining factor. But knowing how to blend with anything is easy if you are calm. Jutero says with a knife hand at Aizawa's throat. The first part of the statement was said when the teacher still couldn't see him. He was wide-eyed and asked how he did that. I had to learn how to walk carefully and gently when I was powered up. That translates quite well to stealth. Aizawa is still shocked and asks what Jutero had in mind. When they reach a clearing, Aizawa gets some of his answers from the appearance of various training machines. The large student does a front flip and then goes into a nimble back flip to land atop a balance bar. He steadily walks backward on it before bending backwards and then walking on his hands. The insomniac teacher is shocked by what he'd all seen and asks his question again. I want you to go back to the basics of ninjutsu as it were. You know how to blend into the darkness, but you should also learn to disappear in the daylight. Not to mention other disciplines associated with ninjutsu. He points out that Aizawa was still applying his skills in a public hero way. And that won't help your techniques grow or help you to finish figuring out your own way of using Kai. The black-haired teacher can see Jotaro's point and agrees to go along with the training. First focusing on training his skills with his balance and concealment. The former on beams and plum flower poles. Then stealth among the trees. Though he gets frustrated at Jotaro identifying him and where for the tenth time during it. I may not have super senses right now, but I can still pick up on your scent or breathing when I calm down. After that, the two trade blows to improve Aizawa's hand-to-hand -hand as well as his channeling of Kai into it. The teacher finding it easier to use when he focuses his breath. During some of these exercises, Aizawa can feel the way to make better use of the Kai. He leads in with left backhand strike, before thrusting his right palm forward quickly while letting Kai flow through it. Jotaro is wide-eyed as he takes the blast of yellow energy fired from Aizawa's hand. Did I just? He mumbles out while looking down at his hand. Jotaro grunts before saying, yeah you did. You're starting to get there your own way. Huh, looks like it has some funny effects. Aizawa looks up and sees Jotaro's hands are a bit limp. The team barely able to make a fist. It fades relatively quickly though, only taking about a minute till he can feel his hands again. That could be useful, but be careful with it. Jotaro advises. Aizawa agrees and asks that they continue. During some of the training, Jotaro notes his understanding on distance and angles in combat. But you forget other lines or issues that could trip you up. Jotaro says before evading just right to where Aizawa trips on some rocks as he was going in for an attack. And then being compromising position for a killing blow. Don't just look at the opponent or the villain. 
You are good at using the shadows, but other items around during a fight could tip you off to many things. Jitaro says before leading Aizawa into a different trap and then a place where his usual style would be compromised. The teacher grunts before asking how he remembered all of this. It doesn't seem like something a kid your age should know. Aizawa remarked after being tossed aside after Jitaro disappeared again. Aside from a memory that records everything I hear, when you lose a sense, you lose a way to distract yourself. Jutero lies while thinking about what Safentite suggested. After they had been training a week or so, both new Kai students felt they had grown quite a bit. With Itsuka even creating a Kai kick art as well. Called the Bofuku, Tsukasasu or Bow Blow, thrust for a straight kick. So, what's next to the Kai but kicking levels of awesome? Hitsuka asked excitedly she and Jotaro were walking back to the dorms. The marital artist girl jumping around a bit and practicing some of what she had learned. Jotaro had a disconcerted look on his face as she asked that. He let out a sigh before saying that was it for now. Just stick with what you've learned for now. This stopped Itsuka in her tracks and she almost face faulted at hearing that. When she recovered, she asked what he was talking about and why he wouldn't teach her more. You know enough. Besides, you still don't have a full mastery or even understanding of projectile Kai attacks. And you aren't ready for anything more. Jotaro says and his resolve hardens a bit even as Itsuka gives him some puppy dog eyes. No, is all Jotaro says and the look in his eyes tells her that he isn't budging on this. Weird. Normally I'd just infer it from his tone or way of carrying himself. But I guess that is part of why I like him. He's not going to bend just because I pull something cute out. He'll stand by what he says. Itsuka thinks before saying that they should do something as a couple again. While he had been training with those two, Izuku had taken to practicing and training with a few others, even helping them improve other weaknesses or suggesting new ways they could use support gear to improve, as well as he and his girlfriend spending time training and relaxing together. Melissa even made some earpieces to help Achako with her zero-gravity side effects. It doesn't completely remove the feeling, but it does make me feel better. Achako reported after making herself and a number of items heavier than her usual limit float. Glad to hear it. So, any idea on what your class is going to do for the festival? Melissa asked. The two Hero Corps students shrugged, with Izuku mentioning that they hadn't been too focused on that. Aizawa-sensei hasn't said anything yet, but I'm sure he will soon. But he has been a bit preoccupied. The trio chuckled before heading back to the one dorm to unwind. Though they have some trouble because quite a few members of the class were still pestering Jotaro to teach them Kai. Come on man, sure I can fire electricity, but if I use too much I'm useless. Can't you show me something? Kaminari pleaded. Minda was in the same place, wanting to be able to more than just restraining villains. Did you forget you were the one who pointed out your style wouldn't go to making it possible? Jotaro asked in annoyance. Even Kota, Sato, and Shoji were curious about if they could learn the techniques as well. And even if they weren't asking, Jotaro could feel the looks from Momo, Mina, and Gyro. He has an infuriated look on his face when he exclaims, I'm not teaching you how to use Kai. I'm not even teaching Itsuka everything. She doesn't need to know all of it, and she can't handle everything. While that did stop everyone from pestering him for a while, Jotaro would regret what he said the next day. So, you don't think I can handle all of what you can teach me? Itsuka says at lunch while looking at Jotaro in anger. Though he can also see a bit of sadness and betrayal there too. That's not it. Look, you don't need to know everything I know. At least, well, Jotaro tries to defend himself, but he isn't sure on the best way to phrase it. Tears seem to well up in Itsuka's eyes before she sprints off. Jotaro stands to go after her, but Safentite stops him. I know one of the reasons you are saying that. And you just going after her won't really help. I'll check in on her, Safentite says before floating off. She eventually finds the girl on the roof of the school. She isn't full bawling, but Itsuka is crying. The martial artist looks up and sees Safentite instead of who she somewhat hoped for. Oh, are you here to tell me I shouldn't be mad? That he has a good reason for not trusting me. I thought, he believed in me, and what I could do as a hero. Sort of and that's not it. Look, he just doesn't know how to tell you what he knows could be risky. I know what he's holding back on. But it isn't my place to say that he shouldn't at least show you what he's afraid to teach you. Safentite says before sitting down and letting Itsuka cry a bit. It was a free period that afternoon, so Jotaro took time to work on his skills. While also trying to think of a way to explain what he was holding back onto Itsuka. You know, just saying she doesn't need to know won't help her. Jotaro turned and saw Mina behind him in the clearing. He sighed before acknowledging she was right. But it's hard to explain what it is that I'm holding back on. There are techniques and skills I know that can be incredibly dangerous, especially if used wrong. Mina nods before asking if it was just that. Or are you afraid she wants to know too much, too fast? You're worried she'll become addicted to the power she's gained or learned. And it could hurt her more than she knows. Okay, don't take this the wrong way, but I didn't expect you to be this insightful. Jotaro says with a chuckle. Mina blushes a bit before saying she may not be book smart. But, I know people, and I've always tried to be the best person that could make people smile or protect them when I can even if I'm absolutely terrified. Jotaro notices the look on her face at mentioning that and asks about the story behind it, only to regret it a bit when she seems to freeze up and remembering something traumatic. He put a hand on her shoulder to try and talk with her. 
She grips his wrist and burns it a bit with her acid. Jutera winces but doesn't make known that it hurt. Instead, he grabs her other shoulder and tells her to look at him. Come on, you're not back wherever someone hurt or scared you. You are an exceptional hero at UA. Mina tears up a bit before looking Jutero in the eyes. She breathes a bit before calming down. When she realizes he was really close to her face, her blush turns her face scarlet. She coughs to cover it up before explaining what she was remembering. Sorry, I just… someone was… scaring and terrifying two of my classmates back in middle school. I jumped in to try and give him the directions to where he wanted to go. But he was still scary to see, Mina said while trembling slightly. Jotaro nods and tells her she definitely has what it takes to be a hero. Mina's heart swells with pride at what he said, though it fades a bit when she notices the acid burns on his wrist. I didn't mean to. I know. It was involuntary in an accident. I'll be okay, Jotaro says with a calm look and a smile directed her way. This just make Mina blush again before asking if he minded practicing a bit of capoeira with her. The large teen chuckled a bit before agreeing and practicing with her for the rest of the afternoon. They wrapped things up as the sun was going down. Hey Mina, thanks. I think I have something of an idea on what to do. Jotaro says with a contemplative look on his face. Mina smirks a bit before saying he was welcome and heading back to the dorms. The depowered hero hummed before going to find Aizawa in 13. After explaining what he wanted to do, they led him into the USJ and changed around the plans for tomorrow's lessons. The next day, everyone from Wana noticed that Jotaro was missing. Midoriya, do you know where Jotaro is? Ida asked while waiting for Aizawa. But the green-haired teen shrugged before saying he didn't see him at the dorm. Mina noted that they had trained last night, but we called it a day before the sun set. He seemed to be thinking about something. Safentide also seemed unsure about what her partner could be thinking. Aizawa comes in and berates him a bit for not calming down. Sir, Jotaro isn't in class, and no one has seen him since last evening, Ida said with a chop of his hands. Aizawa sighed before saying he was helping with a special lesson for later in the day, and you all are going to be a part of it. You two Todoroki, class 1B will also be there. I hope you're ready, Aizawa says before thinking to himself that he was also curious on what Jotaro was up to. Once the afternoon came, all of the students loaded up to head for the USJ again. Some were wondering if Jotaro was going to pretend to be a victim in a rescue scenario, or something like that. When they still didn't see him at the top of the steps a few felt nervous. Safentite and Izuku though felt something ominous coming from the landslide section of the building. Uh oh, he isn't. No, is he crazy? Okay, you know what? I don't care if I get a bad grade from this. I'm not going over there, Safentite says with a firm look. And it doesn't fade even when Aizawa threatens expulsion. The fact she didn't flinch told him that this was bigger than he thought. Especially when she whispered that she'd help with bandaging up the injured afterward. Okay then, the rest of you, head for the landslide zone. Jotaro is waiting for you, I guess, Aizawa said with some fear. The 38 remaining students headed that way with some trepidation and fear, especially when they arrived at the location and saw Jotaro just sitting and meditating. Most of them assumed it was no different than usual, but Itsuka and Izuku could tell otherwise. Okay, he's packing a seriously crazy amount of power and Kai right now. Like I didn't even know this was possible, Itsuka says while feeling the turbulent wave of energy coming off of him. Izuku meanwhile could feel danger sense screaming in his head, and all of it was focused from his friend. No one dared approach even as Jotaro continued to meditate. Shoto gulped a bit before stepping forward to ask him what was going on. You'll be facing off with me today, all of you, and I intend to come at you with everything I've trained in with Kai and the martial arts, Jotaro says with his eyes still closed. He stands calmly and in a pure focused state of mind. Jotaro then opens his eyes and everyone can see the glow of the Kai he manipulated in them. Shoto panics a bit and quickly unleashes an ice wave to stop Jotaro, who just puts his hands close to make a storm fist. But the energy is much greater and more turbulent than any of them had seen before. He fires it toward the approaching wave and shatters it all, even knocking Todoroki back a bit. It keeps going until it impacts on a building, and it seems to carve out a large chunk of the faux skyscraper. Before Todoroki can process or try and use another attack, Jotaro is almost instantly in front of him. He punches him in the stomach before comboing multiple blows into the bi-colored teen's body, culminating with him holding his hands to the side before thrusting forward with what most assume is his rampage straight. But Itsuka can tell the difference in power and calls it a stampede blow in her mind. The name fits as Todoroki is sent flying before impacting on some rubble. Unconscious and with multiple broken bones, everyone is scared and Jurota is next in trying to take down Jotaro. He leaps at him hoping to tackle the large teen, but Jotaro is calm and takes a stance. Jotaro steps into his range and unleashes a powerful uppercut to the beast teen's jaw. It dazes him and leaves him open to the next attack. Jotaro holds his hands to the side for a second before punching downward. Vesuvian. Force. Jotaro shouts as his punch impacts the ground and causes a massive blast of Kai to strike Jirota in the stomach, sending him flying as well, though he isn't unconscious. Jotaro turns to the rest of the students before saying, bring it. No POV. Upon seeing Jotaro sending two of the heaviest hitters of the hero classes flying, the rest of the students panicked a bit. Minda and Shota almost wet themselves at the visage before them. 
Hitsuka and Izuku snap out of it first before rushing Jotaro, with Aida and a few others not far behind them. Izuku arrived first using his powers, but Jotaro easily evaded his attack and quickly kicked him in the back to send him further away. After that Aida leapt in with a strong kick, pushed further by his engines, and Jotaro gently slid under it while grabbing Aida's foot. He then increased the momentum of the blow making Aida spiral out of control into some rubble. Itsuka showed up next and used a few punches and kicks to get her opening to use a Kai attack. But before she could, Jotaro caught her hand and threw her over his shoulder a bit, before shoulder bashing into her and then pushing a blast of Kai through the impact point and sending her flying. Now then, let's go for the more support or ranged focused ones, Jotaro thinks to himself. He glances toward where a few who were staying back to cover their classmates. He rushes past those who were charging him and engages the ranged fighters, Minda being the first one, and he does wet himself as Jotaro arrives. A large teen kicks the shorter one in the chin before putting his hands to the ground and unleashing a stronger version of his rising storm kicks, then adjusting his position in midair to axe kick the top of the short perv's head, planting him into the ground up to his neck. Before anyone can try to help the purple student, Jotaro is on the ground again, and Soccer kicks Minda in the face hard enough to uproot him and send him flying into a building. Jotaro then intercepts a laser shot from Ayama with a storm fist and pummels him unconscious with a series of kicks. Shota uses his gear to unleash some impacts on Jotaro, but he stops the attacks by using an enhanced Gaia wave that knocks the items out of the air. Even when Shota uses his quirk it doesn't matter, as the items he launched embed themselves in the ground. Oh man, I need to work, Shota says before taking an uppercut and then a stampede blow to the face. Gyro hits Jotaro with some sound waves, as well as boosting the velocity of Rin's scales and Pony's horns to try and stop the pain train only for all of them to be shocked when he blasts downward to make a smoke screen and disappears. Gyro focuses on trying to find him with her quirk but is unnerved when she can't hear him. Where are you? Where are you? Behind you, Jotaro says and as Gyro turns to attack, she takes a strong pair of hits to her ears, disorienting her. When a few of the others try to engage him, Jotaro draws on the power of Kai again as well as what he had absorbed for two powerful wave attacks. He slams both fists down on either side of Gyro and says, Krakatoa tremors. And two huge blasts of Kai are unleashed, sending Pony, Rin, Momo, Manga, and Juzo flying. While they are in the air, Jotaro picks out his next targets. A larger teen leaps up to intercept Juzo while he's still airborne and vulnerable, using kicks and punches to knock him around before creating a funnel blast from the power of Shu, blasting the no-lip teen to the ground with the wind knocked out of him. And he is then knocked out with one final punch to his face. He then caught up with Momo and used rising storm kicks to keep her in the air and off balance, before clinching her and using some knee strikes and kicks to keep her disoriented as well, and then headbutted her face before using a spinning pile driver to keep her unconscious. This is insane. How is he doing all of this so easily? Aizawa asks with his eyes wide from the top of the stairs. He and the others were watching through magic orbs Saffentite made to show the battlefield. Saffentite hung before saying, he spent all night and half of the day absorbing all of the Kai he could. Or I say absorbed, it's more like he channeled a storm of Kai into his body and has been keeping it rotating in place for this long. She goes on to say it was basically like Jotaro had and controlled the very power of a volcano, earthquake, or hurricane itself into his body. Meaning right now, those students are facing something akin to the embodiment of a natural disaster. As she was explaining this, Jotaro re-engaged the others he sent flying and quickly knocked them around and out with a series of blows. But that is when Ken noticed Jotaro wincing a bit, even as he need and used a set of spinning elbow blows to Gyro's face and back of her head to knock her out. Why does it look like it's hurting him? He questioned while the other teachers were watching him counter Izuku's Delaware smashes with funnel blasts and storm fists. He then gets in close and unleashes a combo of punches and a close-range funnel blast to send Izuku backwards again. He then deflected and redirected the two hard heads into missing their attacks or attacking themselves, finishing up by making them punch each other in the face and then slamming their heads together to knock them out. When Ida and Izuku rushed in again, Jotaro did a back bend to avoid the kicks they aimed at his head before kicking them both in the back with a low flip. This knocked them both off balance and into position for Jotaro to slam their faces into the ground. Back at the top, Saffentite looked on in worry, but she didn't answer Kan's question right away, just saying he would see when this mad battle was done. Itsuka and Setsuna tried to get some hits in, before making way for Ajiro and a few others to try their own attacks. But Jotaro just held his hands out before spinning to make Setsuna's head spin around as well, before knocking out or breaking some bones on the other students' bodies. Ajiro himself having his tail broken in three places, and Toru was knocked out by a solid blow to her face. Jiro leapt in next to try and help his comrades, but Jotaro intercepted him with a storm fist. Or he would have but the beast boy learned his lesson and quickly shrunk down to avoid the attack. That was close. We can't even land a blow. Any suggestions, Midoriya? A few of the teens who were still conscious say. But Izuku has no idea what he's facing. He never showed me this when we were training. If I had time I could, G.A.H. Izuku said before Jotaro was on him and hitting him with blow after blow. Why didn't Danger Sense give me a heads up? 
Izuku thinks after taking a few kicks and punches to the head. His answer comes from within OFA. It's because of the intent. Danger Sense only picks up on negative emotions and an intent to harm or kill the user. He doesn't want that. In fact, he almost seems emotionless, the fourth user says while observing. All Izuku can think is crap as Jotaro hits him with a Vesuvian impact and overtaxes his current healing capabilities. Knocking the boy out cold. That's bad. We just lost another heavy hitter guys. Ibera, Bondo, try and wrap or stop him. Before either could do that, Jotaro blasted the ground again and disappeared into the dust. He then snuck up on and knocked out Bondo before tossing him into a few other students, then punching the young man to make him accidentally glue himself and a few others to the ground. You will harm no one else. Via Dolorosa, Ibera shouts before unleashing a mass of her vines to trap Jotaro. He breathes deep before lashing out with a cross-cut kick and then copying Itsuka hand blade attacks, though his are not the same kind of sharp as hers. He then trades blows with a few of the other close quarters fighters, sending Itsuka flying after a kick to the face and suplexing Ida into the ground. But Jotaro winced as he could feel the repercussions starting to affect him. Can't take much more. One last attack. As he was thinking that, the students who were still conscious stood to try and take him down. Jotaro was breathing a bit heavily, but he calmed down and held his hands to his side to draw on even more power. Rush him. He's gearing up for something big. Hitsuka shouts before pulling out some restrained gadgets. But as a few get close, Jotaro starts spinning again. This time creating a funnel that is strong enough to suck some of them into it. As well as debris knocking them around. When Iber tries to wrap him up again, a flaming edge seems to fly towards her. She uses her faith shield to try and protect herself, but it cuts through and reduces her hair down to shoulder length. A few others try to wait for a moment to attack, but another massive blast of Kai bursts from the ground and sends them flying. While back in the funnel, Jurota and a few others were battered around by the massive wind as well as debris. When it finally ceases, they are all badly bruised and broken. And only Itsuka is still standing. Though that is a bit generous given she was certain her leg was broken as well as an arm. She gulps and trembles as she can still feel the huge amounts of power Jotaro is exuding. And that power culminates with Jotaro rushing at her faster than she can see, and unleashing a punch right at her face. She can barely wince as the blow comes at her, stopping just short of her nose. While some might view this as him holding back because of his relationship, a different factor tells them he was just showing it a different way. That is reflected on the mountain at the center of the USJ, which now had a massive imprint of a fist on it. Everyone who was still conscious or was just waking up were stunned and terrified by the power Jotaro had shown. Some even passed out again or soiled themselves once more. Itsuka though was trembling and barely able to stand before him. Jotaro takes a few breaths before saying, You wanted to know why I didn't teach you everything. This is why, let alone the shockwaves and repercussions of this technique. You aren't ready. Jotaro then walks past to try and keep them from seeing his pain. But he fails and collapses next to a few boulders before screaming. This shocks everyone and Safentai quickly flies over to check on him and the others. Using her genie capabilities to duplicate herself. Jotaro. John, you did more than overdo it. Their injuries are bad enough, but you know how much strain this puts on you, Sepentite says before laying him down. Others get bandaged up and are helped from the rubble to be further treated by Recovery Girl, with one of Safentite's copies helping Itsuka. She asks to go over to him though to find out more of what happened. There she sees all of Jotaro's muscles looking like they are about to rip him apart, and some of his bones seem to have injuries as well. She was shocked and asked how this happened. It's one of many drawbacks to what he used to fight all of you. Keeping that storm of energy contained and moving through him caused damage over time. I doubt he's going to be moving for a while. Safentite reports as she is keeping his body still. Jutero grunts before saying, I felt that you and the others needed to see the curse of learning or using too much power. Even with all my training, I still end up like this. If I showed you how to do this, there's a good chance you'd die. As he was saying this, Monoma said, you couldn't have just told her. Itsuka looks back at him before looking to her boyfriend. It's because I may not have listened if he just told me. I'd still probably think he didn't trust me. Jotaro gave her an apologetic look before some robots arrived to take him and the rest to Recovery Girl's office. And she was freaking out and somewhat panicking about all of the injuries. When Jotaro arrived she started in on lecturing him as well as being tempted to smack him a bit for his reckless actions. But she stopped when Safentite took her to the side and suggested something else to punish Jotaro. For the next two hours, the old hero spends time resetting bones and then using her quirk to finish the healing process, leaving Jotaro for the end. Actually, I'm not using my quirk on you. I think it's fair that you have to heal up on your own. After all, you thought it was a good idea to overtax your body just to beat on everyone else. Recovery Girl says with an annoyed snort from her nose, and she left Jotaro lying on the bed with a few broken bones. Meanwhile, Safentite and Itsuka were still there and chuckled a bit at his current predicament. You kind of asked for this one. You know that right, Itsuka says with smiling at him. Jotaro groans before saying, maybe. But why are you two still here? Oh, I'm here to give you this, Sepentite says before reaching under the covers and pinching a large amount of skin on his backside, and twisting it, while he's grunting out O oh after O oh before asking her to stop. But when he does, Itsuka decides to do the same and pinches him as well. 
You should have thought more of this through when you wanted to teach or show me how dangerous it would be. While he's still wincing from the pinches, Jotaro manages to say, I know. I know, but I just owe. I couldn't think of Aku move to a different spot. A better way to try and show you. Oh, www. While he's saying this, a few of the ones that were still recovering from were watching from the side. Blushing a bit and chuckling at his misery. Lucky bastard. He's got two girls all up close and personal. Tosai says with a flat look to match his eyes. Linda chuckles before saying, I'd say that some good payback for how he beat the crap out of all of us. Kaminari and Manga give a here, here. In agreement. Nina snorts while nursing a broken arm and some other injuries before going to check in on them a bit. She laughs at Jotaro's situation again before saying, You kind of deserve this. You could have just demonstrated it without beating all of us down and it would have made it clear how dangerous this was. Not you too. Oh, Jotaro says as Itsuka and Safantite pinch a new bit of his skin. They keep this up for about five minutes before finally letting up and tell him they'll have more for him later. He groans again with some tears in the corners of his eyes. A few others had left after chuckling at this but Mina stuck around to have her own talk with Jotaro. She wasn't the only one. Ajiro was still sticking around to ask a question as well. Do you two still want to learn Kai? Jotaro says with a sigh. The other two nod and ask if he would teach them. In my case, I don't want to learn this just because I want a better way to fight or to be flashier in a fight. If we come up against power akin to what you showed, then I need another way to protect myself and others. Ajiro says with a firm look. Jotaro studies his face and can see the sincerity of his intentions. He sighs before saying, it'll have to wait. I'm not going to be able to teach anyone for a while. Ajiro doesn't celebrate in an exuberant fashion, but he is happy for the chance. He puts one fist into his palm before bowing and thanks Jotaro. Mina though seems to have something more in mind than just Kai training. Safi, Itsuka, can you two give us a minute? The two girls look at him a bit funny before agreeing and leaving Mina and Jotaro alone. So are you. Mina stop. I know, Kai isn't all that you want to learn. And that there is something else. Something you aren't willing to say or talk about. Until you are ready to discuss that, I'm not going to teach you. Jotaro says with finality. The pink girl blushes a bit and looks like she wants to rebuke what he said. But looking in his eyes, she feels that crumble away, knowing he was correct. And while looking into her gold eyes, Jotaro can see something else is bothering her. But she has to admit it or talk about it to move forward, he thinks with a small sigh. Mia looks around the room before almost running out of the room, quickly passing Itsuka and Safantite. And both of them notices some minor tears building up in her eyes. They go back in and question Jotaro but he stays quiet about it for the time being. In Sasaku's apartment, she is currently dealing with a new issue. That being that Manla had decided to experiment with some herbs and potions for a new plan. And he summoned something that made her and the others nervous. Or horny in the case of Twice and Toga. The latter of whom was masturbating while stabbing a few copies of Twice. Seriously, you summoned a fucking succubus. Tamira shouts while covering his mouth to keep out the pheromones the demon was letting out. Hey no, I'm only half lust demon. The other is a demon from the sloth ring, said demon says with a flip of her hair. Or not, just as she finished saying that the succubus turned into a male or an incubus, confusing everyone around. Manla noted that it wasn't strange. Demons and angels can be both male and female at the same time. Like they are all gender fluid. They don't fit into one set or category of gender. Though plenty of us have a preferred one. I'm one of the ones who likes both sides equally, the demon says as he slicks back his hair in his male form. Manla then asks them to tone down the pheromones a bit. We don't know how many more copies Toga will cut through, or if twice we'll keep making them. The demon shrugs before undoing the playful spell they wove and the two villains snapped out of it. With that done, Sasaku asks what the mage was thinking when he summoned the demon. Hey I have a name. It's Eblith. But I am curious as well. What could you hope to do with my power? Man coughs a bit before saying he was hoping to get some materials from the underworld to make something special for what was coming up soon. The UA festival is around the corner and it would be a perfect chance to cause some havoc. Tamura likes the idea and agrees it could be a perfect chance to do some damage. If not to the students and a few of the teachers, then to UAS reputation. Natalie sees his point and notes that she did have a few subsidiaries that were associated with the UA support course. I suppose we could slip something in, and then use it to cause some damage. But it can't be traced back to me or my company. If we want to keep off the radar a bit, then we need to be stealthy about this. Natalie says while thinking over a few of the companies that could be used for this. Manla meanwhile smiles before asking if the demon wanted something specific in return. But they just smile before saying, not yet. But I know a few others who might be interested in the chaos you could bring. For now, what is it that you wanted? Well, that's a bit ominous. But I do have a list for you. If you could acquire these in the underworld, it would help to put our plans in motion. Though we especially need this flower for the compound I have in mind. Manla says before bringing out his grimoire and showing the plant in question to the demon. When they see the image, the demon is shocked and slightly off-put, but their smile grows into a sinister one and agrees to find what they need. This will be so much fun, Ebleth says with a smile as they shift between their male and female forms. They then bow and excuse themselves back to the underworld. 
Sasaku sighs before asking what the mage had in mind and to not pull out anything else before asking her. Look, if you want or need a space of your own to work, I can set you up with something. I've already gotten Wu his own lab to work in. It may be a bit strange, but we could get you a lab or somewhere where you can brew what you need. He hums for a moment before agreeing to that idea. I think I know a place he could work. He bought this set of places along the beach recently, so we could have him stay there. But I want someone else to be with him. And I suggest compress. Tamira says before bringing up the images of some old housing units. Is it because he thinks himself a man of magic? Because it seems little more than a parlor trick from my perspective. Nanla says with a roll of his eyes. And while Compress is a bit indignant, he tempers it before saying he was curious about true magic. As you said, all I use is my quirk. But you use real magic and I'd like to learn a bit from it. Maybe not enough to summon a demon, but at least something to help in a pinch. Compress says while removing his mask. The two look each other in the eye and the true mage can see the sincerity at wanting to learn. So he agrees and asks that for the time being he help with packing up a few of his items. Good call. This way we can be safe from possible effects and we can keep an eye on him. Tamira nods and hopes that whatever he was planning worked in the larger scheme. Because we may not have all of the luxuries we hoped for. Especially if what the doctor said was true about his little experiment. With UA, they were starting to get into the swing for the school festival. Namely with the classes having to chose a program to do for the festival. Are we sure this is a good idea though? Mindy questions after Aizawa brought it up. Hiroshima agrees by noting that there had been a lot of villain activity lately, especially with the forgotten and other true metatypes of threats. Saffentite shakes her head and says, it's more to do with respecting and showing appreciation for the other courses. Right sir. Correct Anwar. The UA school festival is meant to help the other courses student put themselves out there. The hero course has the sports festival to show themselves off. But the other groups need to show what they can do for potential employers. Aizawa says from his sleeping bag. Saffentite also notes that it is probably a way to let them have a lot of fun given they don't get to show off as much as the hero course does. Right. So, we have to pick a topic or idea for the festival. Ida, could you pass out some note cards and we'll write them down. Hizuku says. And one of his vice reps is happy to oblige. Hizuku explains that he wants to hear what each of them have in mind before making any decisions. From there perhaps we can get something to compromise on. Am I correct in guessing Yencho? Momo asks as she writes her own suggestion. Izuku rolls his eyes at the title but agrees and puts down his idea for a hero quiz. While Aizawa does think this will drag things out, he wants to respect what Izuku is trying to do. After the suggestions are written, Izuku takes them all and writes them up on the blackboard. However, a few get taken down right away. Namely, Minda and Kaminari's maid and butler cafe idea. Come on, we could do both right. That way we can see the girls and maid get-ups, and they won't be alone. Mind to Wales. But Izuku stays firm in noting that it was still a bad idea. No matter how you slice it, you two still want to perv on the girls. So no, not happening. Izuku says with a flat look directed mind his way. And a few of the girls give a quiet thank you to him. He also eliminates Kirishima's manliness exhibition, Ida's lecture on heroics, and Koda's petting zoo idea. Noting that those were a bit too specific or could be uncomfortable in other ways. Suyu had a similar animal-themed idea, but it was rejected for similar reasons. After some more deliberating, Izuku had narrowed it down to Yuraka's Machai Shop, the hero quiz, a musical or dance performance, or a play. Hey, don't do a play guys. That's what we're doing. Yui says while peeking her head in the class. She explained that she had gone to the bathroom after 1B picked their program and overheard their ideas. Thanks Kodai. That helps eliminate one idea. Izuku says before crossing it out. A few students murmur about while trying to get a specific choice made, but they can't reach a full decision. I think we should do the dance or musical performance, Shoto says from his seat. This surprises everyone and Izuku asks why he wants to go that route. It came up during my provisional license course. After a bit of a struggle, we got the kids to have fun with some music as well as other things. Like me making an ice slide and an essay using his wind to float them up. Mina thinks about it for a minute before mentioning that they could do a routine, and Mindy interjects that they need music. And sure, using currently popular songs would be easy. But that doesn't really feel like we put much work in it. So, why don't we have Kayoka do something? She does have all those instruments after all. Toru says with a raised hand. The earphone jack girl blushed and said that she only put it in as a suggestion since it was all she could think of. Besides, it's not like it has anything to do with quirks or heroics. Right? Saffentite though disagrees and notes that music can be just as much of a tool to use as any gear she might be used to. Given two of the biggest heroes from our world, South Sound and Rockstorm, use their music to fight villains. Heck, we even had a few villains who used music as a weapon. Saffentite thinks to herself, Oh yeah, like you and Jotaro teaching me capoeira. He uses music and rhythm to make a fighting style. Mina says before sidling up to Gyro and asking her to go with the idea. After a minute or so, Gyro broke and agreed to come up with something for the performance. If you need help, Jotaro could work with you on the music. 
He's got a good ear for this after all. Hayoka agrees but asks where he was currently. Recovery girl thought a good punishment for him after beating all of you senseless was to not heal him with her quirk. So, he's currently still recovering from the after effects of whatever it was he used. Aizawa says. With that, Izuku circles the option and the representatives fill out the paperwork to reserve their performance. Hey Gyro, one more thing. If you need some other help, I'm here if you need me. We all are. Izuku says before they leave to submit their idea. She smiles and thanks him before classes go on like normal. With Chitaro having to get caught up on what has been happening after they all get back. Cool. Sounds fun. We didn't do things like this back home so this'll be a new experience for me. Yeah. Hey I was wondering, what instruments can you play? And will you do the vocals? Gyro asks while Jotaro is stuck on the couch in the common area. He hums before asking why she didn't want to do it. I've heard you singing. You're better than me. She blushes at this and asks how he knew. Seriously, how do you think? Jotaro says with a raised eyebrow. Oh right, never mind. Gyro says with a blush. She then mentions that Saffentite suggested him for the music side. He groans a bit but admits he can play a variety of instruments. But I shouldn't be the lead in all of this. I'm good with taking a background role. I can play drums if no one else knows how. Gyro nods and then starts working with the others to decide who will do which role in the band. After it was all done, the chosen band group is Gyro as lead vocalist and bass, Momo on keyboard, Kaminari and Takoyami on lead guitars, Jotaro on the drums and backup vocals. The rest of class want to work for the evening on ideas to go with the song. But all of the noise distracts Gyro and she's having trouble coming up with a start to the song. I might have a good place you can go to get away from the noise. Jotaro says with a look toward Saffentite. She smiles and excuses herself for the time being. The punk girl questions what he had in mind, but all he said was to bring her notebooks and a few instruments to Saffentite's room. You'll see what's going on soon enough, Jotaro says with a smirk. Elsewhere in Japan, Tashinori is running around in his new costume and dealing with trouble in a faster manner than he ever thought possible. Unlike when I was an overly public hero, I can run around and deal with trouble much faster than before, he thinks aloud after taking down two muggers. Though they were each ten blocks away. At one point, there was a burning building and he rushed in to save everyone inside as quickly as possible. After that, he ran so fast that he suffocated the fire before the damage could spread. And with a quick hum he ran to the library and quickly learned all he could to fix the building. And then he did it. All before the police and firemen showed up. He was cheered on by the public, especially when he returned a teddy bear that had been damaged to a little girl that had been living there. And he repaired it good as new. He gave the citizens a quick wave before speeding off again. This definitely feels good for a different reason. Now, wait, I've heard of them. Tashinori thinks as he sprints past a store that had been robbed. Or it was supposed to be robbed. Instead, he spotted an odd criminal duo that were running away from the scene. That being Gentle Criminal and Le Brava. He eases off his power and listens in on their conversation. Planning to follow them and catch or report their hideout to the police. I've heard he's been able to get away from almost every pursuer and make fools out of some. I can't take him lightly. Tashinori thinks as he quickly buys some dark clothes at a thrift store. No POV. Tashinori hummed as he followed the villains toward what he assumed to be their lair. Just what are you up to next? He thinks aloud while keeping his face hidden. The two eventually duck into an old building before Gentle peeks out to check. Tashinori thinks fast and sits down in an alley, pretending to be homeless. Gentle's eyes rest on him for just a moment before shaking his head and going back inside. Something wrong. Labrava asks him when he returns. No. Checked around and saw someone. Just a vagabond from the looks of him. With their guards dropped, Tashinori makes his way over to the building to listen in on their conversations. How they were looking to make a big scene to increase their followers. I'll become someone remembered. Just like I hoped to be when I attended UA. Gentle says after discussing the plans with his partner. The hero is wide-eyed and thinks on the matter a bit. This could be a bit more trouble than we think. But I wonder what could have happened to him. While he was thinking this, clouds quickly gathered and rain started to fall. As he was thinking of dashing off, he overheard something Gentle said. I'm just going to give a little something to that poor person out there. Especially if this rain is going to keep coming down. Tashinori silently curses before light dashing and prays that nothing caught that. He sits back down and tucks his hands in his sweatshirt while curling up a bit. He barely registers that Gentle had come over but acts like he just woke up. Sir, sir, are you alright? Gentle says while looking down at Tashinori. The hero gulps a bit before shaking his head and making it seem like he was just waking up. And he sees the criminal looking down at him with a smile while holding an umbrella. Gentle crouches down and extends an extra one to Tashinori. It's not much, but it might help keep the rain off. Tashinori is shocked but accepts it gratefully. Gentle then shared a quick cup of warm tea with the disguised hero. Be careful sir, it's getting rougher on these streets. Gentle says before taking his leave. Tashinori nods and grunts out a thank you to the man. He looks down before thinking, he isn't a bad person. And if what I heard is right, then his whole focus is. I think I need to talk with Nezu and John about this. Tashinori waits a bit longer before picking up the umbrella and slipping away to get back to UA. Where all of the students and teachers were getting ready for the festival and the various kinds of fun to be had. 
with Pedro taking the children around and aiding where he could. Thanks, Padre. A few third years say after the Brazilian man had helped with some heavy lifting. And while he was doing that, the big three were playing with the trio of Iri, Carmen, and Ernesto. Iri was laughing while flying in the air with Nejire. Carmen was playing hide-and-seek with Mirio. And Ernesto was poking Tamaki's sides to get him to break out of his shell more. Pedro laughs a bit while looking at the children all having fun and playing with the senior students. Abrigado Mirio. Carmen just gets more and more nimble as days go by, the father says as the little girl dodges and evades Mirio's grasp. Yeah, she's a quick little miss. Bet she could do plenty with some chances. Mirio has his usual big smile as he's saying this, but this is off put by his pants dropping around his ankles. The blonde looks down in shock and says, Wait, I didn't permeate, so how did I? Pedro looks to the side and sees the reason. I think someone decided to have some different fun with you. Mirio follows Pedro's gaze and sees that Carmen had stolen his belt, without him even realizing she did it. While the little girl laughs at her prank, the father is less impressed. He gives her a look which make Carmen shrink a little while handing Mirio back his belt. He then tells her to go back to her room. We'll talk about this later. Pedro says with a firm look. Mirio tries to bring some levity back and tells Carmen he'll bring her something later. He then talks to Pedro that he didn't mind that much about the swiping of his belt. It was just a harmless prank. She didn't mean anything bad by it. Pedro looks to the young man before saying he'd see how that could be a slippery or dangerous slope if one wasn't careful. So many from the favela started stealing small things. But not for a better reason like hunger or something like that. Just because it was fun or they felt a rush from it. It led many of them down a treacherous path. Mirio was slightly wide-eyed, but he put a hand on the Padre's shoulder before saying they'd help to keep her on the good path. Who knows, maybe she could use those talents to steal from villains. Pedro smiles again before commenting on how Mirio was always looking on the bright side. Tamaki though asks that Mirio switch with him since Ernesto kept teasing him and asking for the pointy-eared boy to turn into something. His friend laughed at him a bit before playing tag with the little boy. Nejire landed and let her rest after flying around for a while. She starts chattering about her excitement for the festival and what they could expect from each of the courses, as well as mentioning how excited she was for the beauty pageant. Other students had similar emotions running high as they continued to work on their exhibits and productions. Though for a set of trios, they were having their own difficulties. So, Setsuna signed you up for the beauty pageant. Safentite says with a wry smirk towards Itsuka. She blushed and told her friend to shut it. While looking to the side, Tutero commented that Safentite shouldn't be teasing so much. After all, you got signed up for the pageant as well. Hearing this makes the genie girl face fault and ask if he was joking. Wait, did you sign me up? She asks in a panic. No, but I did overhear Minda and Kaminari talking like they wanted to see you in a sexy get-up. And you didn't stop them. Safentite exclaims. Jotaro just shrugs before saying, I was kind of interested to see what both of you would do. And I'm not just talking about putting something fancy or similar on. Before I lose my sight again, I'd kind of like to see what each of your beauty is. After saying that, both Safentite and Itsuka's blushes go nuclear, and they look to the side in a bit of embarrassment. Itsuka grumbles and says, Did you do that just so we'd have more incentive to compete? Jotaro just smiles and shrugs before saying he had to practice with the band group. For Melissa though, she was chosen to be a part of the pageant as well. And she wasn't very happy about it. She asked around the development studio who signed her up and the answer was a surprise. It was the two-time winner of the pageant, Ken Ranzaki by Bimmy. Why do you want me to compete? I'm not even technically a student here. Melissa exclaimed rather gaudy blonde. Who let out a haughty laugh before saying she wanted more true competition. You truly understand beauty. You showed it every day and when you were in the field with the heroes. And frankly speaking you'll bring in some more publicity and interest for the support course. Melissa was dumbstruck by this and vented her annoyance to Achako and Izuku. They both let out slightly confused chuckles at hearing the reason she was competing. But Achako brings her up a bit by saying she could totally win. That girl might have won a few times, but you are way cuter than her. Izuku hummed while thinking over the matter, muttering to himself on what the pageant really was about. At least for the others who compete in it. I wonder. Achako finally snaps Izuku out of it to try and get him to support Melissa in the competition. Oh yeah, listen I'll be back later. There's something I need to look into. Izuku says before hurrying off to his room. Achako gives him a puffed cheek glare as he hurries off. And Melissa just laughs and says, I know you're probably trying to look angry and all. But you just look cute like that. Izuku decided to look into the previous pageants to see what the showy student of the support course had done to win. He saw how she used items and other pieces to accentuate her beauty and appeals during the shows. He smiles to himself before thinking, that's what she meant. Melissa shows her beauty by building and using her gear. She doesn't show just physical beauty, which she definitely has. She shows other aspects of herself with what she makes. That's a pretty way to say it. But maybe you should tell Melissa yourself. Izuku hears this from his door and sees Safentite there smiling at him. He doesn't blush explosively, but Izuku's cheeks do turn pink. He clears his throat and does agree with the genie. I think I will do that. 
he quickly leaves to suggest or talk about that with Melissa, while Safentite thinks about what Izuku said and how it could relate to her own appeals. And she shares the information with Itsuka. Why would you tell me this? Are we, while competing, Itsuka questions with a confused look to the genie girl. Safentite smiles and says, yes, in more than one way. But frankly, I'd prefer to compete fairly, especially because you deserve it. Itsuka blushes a bit and thanks Safentite and starts thinking about what to do for her set of appeals. When Tashinori made it back to UA, he went to Nezu to talk about what happened. Though he had to pretend to be Hibiki Ten again, and used it as a segue to ask about a possible former student that he suspected Gentle to be. But once he was done with that he wanted to talk to Jitaro. Hey, you all working hard? He asked when he arrived at the one of dorms. Jairo was finishing pieces to her song for the performance, but what she had done was sounding good and so were her bandmates. Each of the students gave All Might a cheery hello as he walked up. I need to talk with Jutero about something. Can you spare him? Jairo smiles and says they'll manage. But hurry back. I need my back up, she says with a smirk directed the large teen's way, who just rolls his eyes and asks Tashinori what he wanted to talk about. I'm not here. Can we speak somewhere, private? Sure, I know what you mean. Jutero says with a slow nod and directed him to his room. Once there, they used his portal to go to his and Safentite shared pocket space. Tashinori shakes his head while looking around the strange space and takes his seat in the reception, relaxation area. Once there, Tashinori relays what he discovered about the villain who was looking to sneak into the school festival, and what his motivations were for doing this. I want to take him down, but at the same time, I understand where he's coming from. He had a dream to be a great or notable hero, and was told, forced out and to become something completely different. Jutero had started with a neutral look, but it quickly turned to an annoyed and angry one as the story went on. I'd say he's a victim and culpable in a few ways here. First is that he's a victim of the systems and institutions of what it means to be a hero. But in the same way he's culpable for his own state because his actions hurt others. The hero notes that it was another problem with too many powers, heroes, and meddling from the government. And he does relate this back again to that quirks were too widespread and gives people the wrong ideas in many ways. There was a reason so many of us from my world kept their identities a secret. It's not about avoiding responsibility. It's about making sure others in our family aren't held responsible for our choices. Look at what happened to his family. How they were forced to shoulder the debts and their home was attacked because of it. That isn't right. Tashinori thinks about it and agrees. I never had to worry about it since. Well, most of my family were gone. And those who were alive by the time I came back saw it as a good thing. Given I was popular and made a big rise through the ranks. He then notes that he himself was a bit culpable as well, given he made such a splash that it made so many others want to become heroes as famous as he was. So, what do you want to do? Jutero asks with a raised eyebrow to the retired pro hero. The man thinks it over a few times, how his influence had messed with or changed some of the perception of heroes, for better and worse, and how he could relate to the dream the young man had and how much it likely hurt to have that dream destroyed. Tashinori said he still didn't have an answer, but I'm working towards it. I've asked Nezu to leave this to me for the time being. I need to make a bit more of a name for myself as Hibiki, but more importantly I think I can maybe get him to stand down. Jutero nods and tells his friend good luck before returning to normal space. Once he did return, he saw Mina and the rest of the dance team trying to build a routine to go with Gyro's song. They were getting somewhere but some are having trouble getting in proper sync. Come on guys, Gyro is putting everything into writing this awesome song. We have to match up with her work, Mina exclaims as she tries to get each member of the dance team. Izuku is somewhat getting there, given his training in capoeira with Jutero and Safentite. So, he could get into the rhythm and step a bit to it. But he was having trouble with coming up with new steps with it. Ida was, sticking with the robot, while Toru and the rest work out their own ways of dancing. Jutero has a bit of a laugh at their efforts before getting back to the music and drumming out the rhythm for the performance. Minda notices and questions if he thought he could do better. I'm not one for just dancing by myself, Jutero says with a smile. This gets Mina curious though and asks what he meant by that with a smile. Care to show us how you'd dance? Not doing it, Jutero immediately says. But Mina doesn't give up and starts leaning on him. Literally, Jutero keeps his cool for the most part, but he can feel the girl pushing her breasts against his back. Come on man, you shouldn't be affected by this. You know what she looks like with nothing on. And then there's Sahara and Itsuka. Jutero shouts in his mind. The former of the girls mentioned though, decides to have a bit of fun with his misery. Oh, why not Jutero? You learned how to dance from when you were really young and we'd practice plenty of times, so why not show her?" Safentite says with a shit-eating grin. Jutero keeps denying, but he's slowly breaking down thanks to Safi and Mina giving him something he's no longer immune to. The puppy dog eyes and pouting. His eye twitches a bit and he grumbles out, this is one of the problems to being able to see before agreeing. So long as Mina was with him and Safentite provided the music. The latter was more than happy to oblige while the former was nervous and excited at the same time. Damn, thought she'd be opposed. Jutero thinks before telling Mina he'd be doing something a bit slower than she might be thinking. Duo, what did you have in mind? The pink girl asks while trying to keep the illusion that she wasn't nervous. As the music starts, Jutero gently takes Mina's hands, pulls her in slowly. 
then flows her out a bit to a spin. Mina loses herself in the music as Jutero catches her hand and turns her once closer to his body, her back against his chest as she reaches up and puts her hand on his cheek. He leads her into a turn again and then into a gentle movement of steps, and the looks the two give each other make those watching blush, and Achako notices that Izuku seemed to be moving similar. Hmm, come on Izuku, let's join them, Achako says while taking Izuku's hand. The green teen sputters a bit but gulps before moving his hands where Jotaro and Safentite had shown him. Can't believe they were right about this coming in handy later, he thinks while remembering the lessons in the time bubble. While the newest two are a bit clumsy but still having fun, the first pair start to enjoy themselves a bit more. Especially when Jotaro lifts Mina and then after a few more moves and spins, he flows it into a near bridal lift and spin. As Mina tucks her head into the crook of Jotaro's neck. Damn it, I thought he would have two left feet. Or whatever the expression is, Mina says with a disgruntled look. A few of the others agree as Jotaro and Mina separate and dance a bit solo. Then start to move closer once more, rotating slightly as they come together and putting their hands into positions as they do is right upon her hips and her right on his shoulder, even if it's a bit harder to reach. The two then start some steps with Jotaro leading as they move around the floor again. Jotaro swings her out gently before pulling her closely in with a spin embrace, then around once more before dipping her as the song ended. And while she was able to focus on the dancing and enjoyment of dancing in the moment, now that the song was ending, she noticed the look he was giving her, and it made her blush purple, and it wouldn't fade as he lifted her up. Um, wow, that was different, and it felt really good too. Mita muttered out in some embarrassment which makes Kaminari and Minter rage once more about how the powerhouse of their class was charming another girl. And I don't even think he's trying. With the matter done he asks that they move on, and he gets back to practicing. Unfortunately for him, someone took a video and posted it, which led to some from 1B coming over to tell him off for flirting with another girl. You haven't danced with Kendo, and you're dating her. Kanoko says while weaking punching at Jutero. Actually, he has. It was more private. Itsuka said with a smile directed at Jutero, who rubbed the back of his head and lets out an awkward laugh and it was Monoma who showed the video some at the karaoke place had taken and posted. Wait how did you know about it? Itsuka asks with a narrowing of her eyes at the blonde. While this was happening, Izuku and Archako went to visit Melissa. She'd been given a more private lab to develop tools and the like. Currently, she was working on a new suit of armor. This one had a darker color scheme and a smaller jetpack compared to her usual armor. And the face was fully covered compared to her usual suit that would work as a set of goggles and minor head protection. Working hard I see, and it's kind of pretty how your face glows while you're doing that, Izuku says with a smile. His words get Melissa's attention and make her blush luminant. Achako snorts before saying, did Jotaro teach you how to say things like that? Things that make girls go weak in the knees. Izuku blushed as he thought about what he said. He coughed before asking what Melissa was working on. Oh uh, this is model 18. It's a stealth suit. I've been building with some focus on a variety of situations, the inventor says before finishing what she was adjusting. She then types in some commands on the keyboard, and it makes the suite virtually invisible. Whoa, that's so cool, Achako says before going over to touch the machine. She then comments that she could be as stealthy as Hagakure with this, and you've probably got way better options if it comes to a fight. Well you're not wrong, but I don't have as many options as my normal suit, and I still need to calibrate this one for flight. Melissa exposits, Izuku was more interested in something different. You called this one Model 18. If the first one you built with Safi's help was Model 1, and your usual suit is, maybe Model 2. Doesn't that mean you have 16 more suits of armor? Melissa stops before sighing and using her computer to turn on some of the other lights. It's there that Izuku and Achako witnessed her larger arsenal of armors. She had one that was more suited for underwater, a suit that seemed to be focused on longer range flight, one with a bigger arsenal compared to the rest etc. Whoa, these are all awesome. Are you trying to become a one-woman army with this one? Achako asks excitedly while looking over the heavy armament one. It had a variety of extra guns, missile and rocket pods, and other weaponry. Melissa clears her throat before saying, no. That was, well admittedly it was me having more fun with the, American perspective, trying to add a bunch of guns if it's needed. Izuku mentioned that she probably didn't need it if used the 13th armor he was looking at. The machine was larger than the rest. It was taller than All Might in his buffed up state and seemed to have enhanced defense and other gear to fight with. What made you come up with this one? Izuku asked while looking it over. Melissa looked down before saying, my imitator if you will. He likely got his last bit of inspiration from when we saved that cruise ship, and I showed off my armor. He wears a suit that is larger and stronger than mine, so I wanted something that could compete. If necessary, both of the Hero Corps students could see the reasoning behind that and asked her a bit more about the other suits. While she was describing them, Achako noticed that she seemed to glow when she was talking about her gear and what it could do. She smiled before saying, I think I get what you meant Izuku. She does seem to glow a bit when she's talking about or working with her gadgets. Melissa blushes again at this praise and Izuku comes in to make it a bit worse. Before she could pass out from the embarrassment though, Izuku surprised her in a different way by suggesting that she use her armors for her appeal during the pageant. 
Melissa stops blushing before wondering what Izuku was talking about. You can show your own kind of beauty just like Kinranzaki did. Both of the girls look at him funny and he uses his phone to show some of the appeals. She was a bit ostentatious in each, but in each of her appeals she would give a showy appeal with the devices she made. Both of the girls were surprised and that is when Melissa starts to put it together in her mind. How she could use each of her armors for her appeal as well as an idea for a new armor. She quickly kisses Izuku and thanks him before rushing him and Achako out. I've got some work to do. Thanks, Melissa says before calling Mei to ask if she was willing to help on a new project. And the girl arrives faster than Melissa believed possible. With Izuku and Achako, after being shocked at Hatsum rushing past them, they were each considering more of what could happen for the festival to come. Hey Izuku, how about we practice dancing a bit more when we get back? Achako asks as they are walking through the halls. Izuku likes the idea and agrees. At least until they got back, and Mina told Izuku he was fired. From the dance team anyway. You aren't bad but we need your help on a different project. We're going to use Ayama like a disco ball. And Safi is dancing as well as making magic fireworks. Oh, okay that makes sense. Izuku says. Achako seems a bit sad about this but her spirits get brought up a bit when he tells Achako he could still dance with her to practice. Bringing his other girlfriend's spirits up again. While they were all working on that, Jairo was currently working in a place that shocked her. So, if I'm understanding this right, you and Jotaro made this place to relax. And it technically is outside of normal space-time. Jairo said the first time she visited. Safentite shrugs and said, more or less. It was a good way to avoid a lot of extra noise from the world or threats to the outside. Which helps Jotaro and keeps most safe from some of the things I've made. Jairo double takes at that and asks what she meant. Don't worry about it. Jairo shook her head before focusing on the task and was impressed by the number of instruments Jotaro had. Oh come on. He was impressed by my Les Paul, but he's got a few himself. And one strange looking. What is this? Jairo asked while looking at an odd guitar that seemed to have axe blades on either side of the body. Safentite looked at it with a mix of nostalgia and sadness. It's something from a friend. Never mind about that. You've got some more work to do. Jairo nods and agrees before getting to work on the music for their performance. Is it ready? Almost. Just need a good way to hide these for the plan to go off without a hitch. The ones talking were Mandla, Compress, and Ebleth. Mandla had finished making a compound for a special poison or sickness to be spread through UA. Now comes the problem. These compounds can't really be sealed. At least not in something like a grenade. Mandla explains that the mix needed to be consistently exposed to air over a period of time so they could go off. That's where I come in, right? Compress says with a look through his mask. Manla nods and fills up a few vials with the compound he made. Compress takes them in hand to shrink the objects into marbles. With that done, they set the marbles inside of a few crates to be shipped to UA from one of Sasaku's shell companies. I'm curious. Why didn't you make a concoction that would work as a grenade or anything? Compress asks as they all change and pretend to be workers. The best some of those might do is cause an explosion or cause a short-term sickness. You want the maximum effect you have to breathe life into it so to speak. Like letting plants absorb CO2, the strongest and deadliest potions need a life of their own. Manla says while moving some of the boxes. Compress shrugs and goes along with it since he was the actual mage among them. Ebleth was intrigued about what could happen next. Whether it succeeds or not isn't really that important. This still could lead to all kinds of fun. They think as the crates with the potion marbles are set inside. No POV. So how do you intend for these potions of mine to get into UA? Manla asked after Compress has used his quirk to seal up the vials. Natalie smirked at the newest member and asked him to come with her. If they don't see or feel anything off, then it will be fine. They think they are untouchable after all. She then shows him a box containing some delicate parts to be sent to UA. And the packing material is similar to the marbles Compress makes. All we need to do is have you put these in here and wait. You release your quirk after we confirm they've stopped or are inside and we've got ticking time bombs in the school. The stage magician and maid shared a look before shrugging and sticking a few of the potion marbles into the top of the boxes. With that, they were sealed up and sent off to UA. Natalie confirmed that it was about a week until the school festival started and asked Manly if the mixture would activate on time. It should be fine. So long as no other liquids mix or leaves any kind of mess it will be alright. Manla says with a shrug. Natalie returns it and says, good enough. In the meantime we should prepare for other matters. Tamura, has Jiren gotten any more items he wants to make? Or does he need materials? Tamura shakes his head and notes that the black market dealer was fine and safe at his new lab. He's been collaborating with Wu and they've been looking to make some improvements on all of our gear. Including this. Tamura rolls up his sleeve and shows his new combat arm. One with a grapple gun, plasma and laser cannons, extendable blades, and an acidic, disintegrating touch. Natalie whistles and says, while I'm not condoning maiming, it does seem like you got something better compared to what you originally had. Tamira laughs and agrees with her given he now had more offense options when it was time to clear mobs. He then asks if they'd heard from any of the other members. Not much. Dabai and Psych Link were checking around a few areas after we lost some of our smuggling routes. Emma, Ryan, Toga, and Kenji are looking to try and recruit some others, but they've been coming up dry or not finding anyone who is really any help. 
with their report to Mira's side before noting that they'd have to wait for the potion bombs to make some statement, claiming responsibility for sneaking inside and poisoning a lot of people. That should break more of the faith in heroes, agreed Tavarish, though we've got to wait a week for that. In the meantime, I've got some companies I'm in other businesses I'm looking at picking up, Natalie says with a rubbing of her hands. And while Tamira doesn't want the money the same way, he can't deny the enjoyment of having more people bowing to him, even if he was just the number two with Sasaku's company. With the packages, they were quickly shipped off to UA to be held in the development studio. And when everyone arrived for the festival, they would unleash a massive gas to make multitudes of people sick. Or at least that was the original plan. Damn it Hatsum, another explosion. Power loader coughed out after yet another of May's inventions backfired and exploded. This time though, it did major damage to the studio and the various storage areas. May brushes it all off by saying this was what progress demanded. Only for the girl to be restrained by something new Melissa had been working on. Quick acting, smart metal, straight jackets. Thank you for that shield sin. I think it's time we make sure she can't get into the studio for a while. Agreed. But what about the studio? Have they finished their display? And what about? Oh, of course. Right as this happens, the new parts arrive. What do we do? The young inventor asked with a look at the support hero. He sighed and said, take these to a few of the battlegrounds. We can use that as temporary storage. Melissa grumbles as the other students were busy with their own work. So she called to ask anyone she knew if they had free time. Izuku being the first one, and he checked to see if anyone else was free. I can help you out, Midori. I've shown everyone what they should do for the performance. All that's left is for them to get in sync, Mina said with her usual cheery smile. Izuku thanked her and said they could use someone else. Most of the other members of the stage team though were busy with other matters. Be it makeup homework or helping with setting up the stage. The band group were making progress with their song. With the exception of Safentite who was working with Itsuka and Nejire for their appeals during the pageant. So what's Melchan doing for the pageant? You seen it yet? Mina asked with a smirk toward Izuku. The teen coughs with a light blush and says she had a plan to use her machines and some special tools to show off. You'll have to see for yourself. On the way toward the front entrance, Izuku spotted Bakugo looking bored outside of his general education class. I take it you're not doing anything. Any chance you'd be willing to help out some classmates? Izuku says with a look to his former friend. Bakugo snarls a bit but he calms down and mentions that his group was mostly done so there was nothing else for him to do. So what the heck? What's the big problem? Izuku shrugs and just mentions that Melissa had asked for some help and he was going to give it. To which, Bakugo gave Izuku a flat and annoyed look as they were walking to the entrance. Izuku, Mina, and, I forget, what's your name? Melissa asked innocently enough so Bakugo didn't take it too personally. It still stung the boy though. Izuku introduced the two and asked what it was she needed help with. Oh right, I just need some help moving these boxes. They blew up the lab and a bunch of our moving bots. So we needed some muscle. Mina smiled before holding up her arm and saying, we got you covered Mel. Even if Bakugo is only in the general course, he looks like he works out. Bakugo's eye twitched before asking that they get this over with. He steps over and picks up a box. Or he would have, but it was far heavier than he expected and he threw himself back and fell onto a different box. One that cut him and he bled onto a recently opened one. Izuku curses and loans Bakugo a handkerchief to clean some of the blood. And for once the explosive boy doesn't rage at Izuku. He takes it with a grumble and cleans up the blood. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Some of these are kind of heavy. Better for you to handle, Izuku. Melissa says before pointing out a few other boxes the weaker members could lift including the one Bakugo cut himself on. Just be careful, some of the parts inside are delicate. Bakugo snarls before saying, fine. So where do we take these? He lifts up the box in question after setting the handkerchief inside box. Melissa says they needed to take it to Ground Gamma, as it would be stable and a safe place to store the extra parts they ordered. Izuku moves the heaviest boxes and his increased stamina thanks to his powers makes it little trouble for him to get there. The others though sweat while lugging the boxes to a stable building in Ground Gamma. I thought you said these were light. Mina says after moving the third set of boxes. They are. We're just having to move them more than we thought. Here, Melissa says before pulling out a towel for her and the others to wipe off their sweat. Well except for Izuku. He was barely sweating after moving four heavy boxes. This is good cardio. Maybe I should help out at the development studio more. All the rest could do was give him an annoyed look. With Bakugo giving him a middle finger in anger while trying to catch his breath. He and the others wiped off the sweat again before checking that some of the parts and items were still in good condition. MH. Yep, everything looks fine. Now I don't know about you all, but I could use a shower. Between the smoke and moving all of these, I stink. Melissa says with a shake of her head. Really? I don't think you smell bad. Izuku says nonchalantly as they walk out, making Melissa blush and stop. She gulps before catching up to him to bump his side slightly. You did that on purpose, didn't you? Maybe. But I did mean it, the two say with Izuku giving Melissa a warm smile. This makes her blush brighter and she grabs Izuku's face and kisses him. Dummy, she says before taking off. From the outside though, Bakugo and Mina were both shocked. While Bakugo was shocked, Mina was blushing from the cute interactions of the two. Freaking Deku got a girlfriend. 
is the universe gonna implode? Actually, it's not just a girlfriend. He's got two, Mina says with a smile. But this makes Bakugo freeze up again and grumble about how much everything for them had changed for them. I was the big dog in Aldera, but ever since that sludge villain thing, it's been a bit downhill for me. Mina looks at the blonde before asking what he meant. Bakugo gave her a jaundiced account, but it showed her the inferiority complex the boy had been growing since he started attending UA. Maybe you need to let go of what you thought made you better or stronger, and thinking it is the absolute or whatever. Jutero has been showing how that doesn't matter multiple times. Not just by smacking down quirk users, but even now that he's got no powers, he can still take those with powers down. With his whole Kai manipulations, the pink girl had a wistful and yet somewhat sad look on her face while talking about this that made Bakugo a little suspicious. You got a thing for him, he asked bluntly, which just made Mina face fault a bit before trying to cover it up. Bakugo rolls his eyes and says he didn't really care. But you were willing to listen to my griping. So I thought I should return the favor. Back Hugo says with a look to the side. Mina smiles and thanks him, before teasing the explosive boy and asking if he was interested in her. Not a chance. I don't really give a damn about that. Well, that was blunt. But it is a tad reassuring that he probably won't saying anything about this. Mina thinks as they return to the main building, not realizing that they left the bloody and sweaty towels atop some of the open boxes and those fluids mixed with the recently revealed potions. With the pageant participants, they were practicing a few ideas they had for their appeals. With Itsuka feeling a bit frustrated that her Kai attack, while generally cool to look at didn't have quite the same appeal, and they tended to tear apart the dresses she was trying on. Can I get one that holds up to me going a bit more all out? Itsuka asked after tearing through a third dress. She ripped off the remains leaving her in a sports bra and panties. Safentite chuckles a bit before noting that she had a different advantage. I create this stuff myself, so as long as I imagine up what I want, it should be able to handle anything. And with what I'm planning for the pageant, I'm not using quite the same set of stressors on my clothes. Medjire notes after floating in the air and trying to make shapes with her quirk. Itsuka grumbles while pacing a bit. She was going to ask if Safi could make her a dress that could handle what she had in mind. But those thoughts were disrupted by Jotaro and a few others arriving. Hey girls, it's about time to eat and, mind to, I'm going to say this one time so listen up. Turn around and walk away, or I will blast you into next millennium. Jutero says before glaring down at the short teen who was ogling Itsuka, and his lust-filled face turned to one that made everyone assume he wet himself. Jutero glare was passed to a few others who quickly ran off before they got a taste of the planet's wrath. Safi then made Itsuka some sweats to cover herself as the girl looked ready to bury her head in the ground. I want to make a crack about already knowing what you look like with nothing on, but that isn't what you need. You still said it though. I can take out a little frustration on Minda and the others another day right. Itsuka says with a pout. Safentite jokes that it would be a bit justified. Just don't go too far. Jotaro though wonders if she was planning to perform in her current attire or if she was thinking about a swimsuit appeal. Medjire titters before saying, no. She just can't get a dress that can handle her going all out with her Kai skills. Jotaro has an all look before nodding and asking how the practice and preparations were going. Aside from me tearing apart my clothes, mixed. Itsuka explains that Safentite already had something of a routine worked out and other ways to show what she could do. Nejire was deciding on the shape she was going to use for her appeal. And me, I want to make a big splash with my Kai techniques and all. But they don't go very far from my body. Even with the storm fist I finally learned how to do. Totero chuckles before mentioning that he may have something she could try. You'll have to make it your own obviously. But I might have something you could use for a big finish, last resort attack. Itsuka just gives him a look to say, why didn't you teach it to me first before sighing and asking what it was? A large teen smirks before stepping forward and holding his arms straight out from his sides. He takes a few deep breaths while charging the Kai around him. He starts to rotate his arms in front of his body, initially seeming no different from his usual storm fist. But he doesn't stop moving and rotating, seemingly concentrating all of the Kai into position right in front of him. He continues to rotate the energy as it grows and then holds it above his head, forming a massive ball of swirling power. Safentite whistles and says, So you're thinking on teaching her the Tempest Blast. But even you can't form it quickly. You sure she can handle it? Itsuka gives Safi a half-hearted glare but moves on to focus on the technique. Jotaro grunts as he holds the sphere aloft before answering the question. She can. And frankly I think she can make it work better than I can. After all, I created the Storm Fist technique since it took so long to make this. Itsuka was wide-eyed at hearing that but she could easily understand the principles to try and make her own version. And she was somewhat incentivized when she saw the power of the attack. You might want to aim this a different way, but that is where the next technique I'm going to show you could come in. Oh yeah, what is it? Jotaro smiles before bringing his hand in front of his face in a meditative pose. He keeps his index and middle fingers aloft after a few seconds and gathers Kai to the tips of his fingers. He shouts out before firing a laser-like shot from the tips. Once the shot was done though, Jotaro was shaking his hand in a bit of pain. Itsuka looked at him weird before asking how the technique was different from any other he'd shown. To an extent, it's probably not. I don't actually have a name for this so you could call it whatever you like. 
I created it originally when I wanted to fire off massive or precise amounts of energy from my body. I focus it from my reserves and then I've got a gamma, electro, etc. laser. Itsuka still looks suspicious but relents before asking. It just takes me focusing the energy to the tips of my fingers. Right. Like so. She then takes the stance cop is what she saw Jotaro do. Only for the beam to only go a few feet. Which makes the girl blush because she strode up thinking it would be an easy technique to learn. Jotaro laughs before saying, it's not quite that simple. You have to keep channeling energy to it. In this case, keep the Kai flowing to that point and it will extend the range. Power varies a bit, but it will give you some range. Itsuka nods before taking the stance again and letting the energy of the planet flow around her. At feeling a critical point in the flow, she thrusts forward again. And tries to keep the energy flowing around her like when she uses her Teifuhashi combo. It lasts for a few more seconds than before, but it is still unstable. The two more experienced Kai users nod and applaud how quickly she learned the technique. I think you'll be able to take this skill of mine beyond anything I could do. And not just because I'll eventually have to stop using Kai. You have the diligence and drive that can truly make the most of what we've been teaching you. Itsuka smiles and thanks Jutero, before trying her hand at the Tempest Blast. She could gather the energy, but she couldn't make it fly or go as far as she wanted. And kept having to be caught by Nejire and the other two. I think that's enough for today. Besides, we've all got a week before the festival and the pageant. Plenty of time to improve, Nejire says with her usual pep. Itsuka shrugs and agrees, so they all start heading back to Heights Alliance. Though even as she is walking, the redhead keeps trying to build up even a small amount of Kai to practice. For the other extra participant in the pageant, she was currently adjusting some of her armors to give a different kind of appeal. Let's see. The overwhelming firepower armor I'll swap some of the rounds and the like for more firework-esque shots. Finally got stealth's flight capabilities configured. Probably won't need the Aqua Rider, though I could use it in conjunction with Frigid Lands for a little something different. And, Mega Mech Might and Starfall could be great as finishers. The last armors mentioned were a special duo based on the two heroes who were the strongest in the current age. The Triple M armor was built more around pure strength and power, just like All Might in his prime. Starfall meanwhile was modeled slightly after Star and Stripe, with some extra pieces to counter or mirror the strongest woman in the world. From shields and refractors to deal with lasers, even the capability to move and operate without an atmosphere. Even a really special piece to deal with the hero's need to touch an item to apply a rule. If anyone other than the main user got close to it, a powerful shock field would blast anyone nearby. Aside from that, the color schemes of both played perfectly into each other. Given she based Triple M on All Might in his golden age and Starfall was based on the very hero it was meant to contend with. These two will make one heck of a finishing entrance. But in the meantime, still need to finish one last piece. Melissa mutters to herself before looking over a new armor. One with a special gimmick she'll be happy to show once it was done. As the days went by and all the students were getting ready, they never even knew about the trouble that was stored in Ground Gamma. No POV. Let's move Le Brava. We must get to UA as quickly as possible. Gentle said after leaving their hideout. The short girl nodded and quickly followed her partner and idol. They hurried while also following Gentle's schedule including a place to get a very nice cup of tea before they could sneak in. After enjoying the refreshment, they covered their heads again and made their way to make up for any lost time. I had a feeling you'd be here. This is a very nice cafe after all, and the tea is quite good. The pair hear this from an alley they were passing, and who should walk out but the same vagabond that Gentle had extended kindness toward prior. Sir, the white-haired villain said while putting himself between the homeless person and Le Brava. I do want to thank you for kindness you showed, and I don't believe you are an evil person at your core. That said, I cannot allow you to disrupt the school festival all of those students have been working for. Before he could be asked what he meant, Tashinori created a large amount of light before spinning around and changing into his costume. The pair of villains were wide-eyed at the startling change, even more so when they both recognized his current state. The true metal lightspeed hero. Ten wasn't it. Or Hibiki, Gentle exclaimed while backing away from the hero. Tashinori smirks a bit before saying, To be honest I've never really been able to come up with a name for myself. But that isn't what is important right now. At this moment, my job is to stop you. Tashinori then dashes forward to try and knock out the villain. Though that doesn't happen as Gentle used his quirk to make even the air itself elastic. And Tashinori bounced right off of it. He quickly regained his composure though and sought to strike once more. But the villains took this as a moment to get away. With Gentle making a trampoline beneath his feet and using that to bound himself and Le Brava above the crowds. While well, that was embarrassing. Thought I could finish this fast but I underestimated him. Tashinori says before running along under the two. Le Brava, take cover. I'll try and get him to stop. Gentle says after landing in a construction zone. The girl nods and hides as Tashinori arrives, punching Gentle in the face. But the man doesn't give up too easy and just as he was impacting a steel girder, he made it elastic and bounced himself around the under construction building. Tashinori curses to himself before running up the side of the girders to try and intercept the villain. But just as he is about to hit, Gentle makes something else elastic and bounces away, even bouncing back a kick aimed at the villain's midsection. Okay, didn't see that coming. He's making it hard to hit him, let alone the fact he's turned this whole area into a weapon. 
as Tashinori was focusing as hard as he could speed up his perception to try and find a weak point to attack. He does get a few hits in, but Gentle keeps out of reach well enough to make it hard to get a finishing blow, especially after he gets hit by another Gentle rebound to knock him away. This is getting old, Tashinori exclaims after bouncing around again. He finds a hopeful moment when he grabs onto Gentle's cape, but the villain had made it elastic as well and used it to slingshot himself with more force, right into Tashinori. After getting knocked back a bit, Tashinori sees a way to use that to his advantage. He grabs the cape once more and that makes the villain stretch back toward himself. You don't learn, do you? Gentle exclaims, but is shocked when Tashinori says, that's what you think. And he ducks right as the villain was hurtling towards him, making Gentle impact on the ground that he hadn't made elastic. Clever, but it won't stop me. Gentle exclaims before making the ground elastic to use gently trampoline and bounce Tashinori up into the air when he charged the man. Oh come on. Then again, I guess he has made a name for himself with his escapes. Tashinori thinks, while also worrying about the fact he had nowhere to run on now. And Gentle capitalizes on this. He makes a pair of cranes elastic to slingshot himself at Tashinori in hopes of knocking him out. The hero sees this and tries to think of a way to avoid or counter the attack coming. Then remembering something Jotaro had told him. You are getting a better handle on what you can do now Toshi. But you need to think around what you can do now. You don't have a quirk that just makes you run faster or similar kinds of kinetic enhancements. You have more potential than you realize. Jotaro said this after a session while the boy was an intern. Tashinori looked at Jotaro funny before asking, How do you mean? I can just run fast right. Like running on water and similar. Not that I've tried it yet. The teen shakes his head and points to the one note aspect he's still focusing on. And he explains that speed is only one factor that's been changed. You mentioned a clock before and how his quirk let him perceive the world at high speed, as well as him moving at high speed. But you likely can do more with it given you don't have the same limits. And given what Mirko mentioned about your new form it could have even more applications. Such as, Tashinori asked with a skeptical look. One thing Jotaro noted was that he didn't have to stop or cool down between uses. He could keep his thoughts and perception at high speed almost indefinitely. Not to mention, there could be more drastic or impressive applications you haven't awoken to you yet. Maybe even a way to move through objects or similar. Tashinori just looks at the team with a flat look of incredulity. Given that even at his best, a clock could never do that. It just wasn't physically possible, let alone being irrational. You need to let go of what makes sense or can be described by science or similar. Forget rationality. Forget science or what you think is true. Think more on what makes you different from those with a quirk. If this doesn't work, I'm gonna kick your ass, Jotaro. Tashinori thinks aloud before calming down and fully enhancing himself with his power. The world slowed down more by his perception and in that state, he could tell he couldn't dodge. At least not the normal way. He takes a measured breath before focusing on what he can do and letting it flow through his entire body. And within the span of a few seconds, Tashinori's body had basically become light itself. While this had been happening in slow motion for him, Gentle Criminal was assured that he would impact on the hero and at least knock him away or out. Only to be shocked when he passed right through Tashinori's body, and kept flying for a few miles. Gentle, Labrava exclaimed at seeing her hero missing his chance and going in the opposite direction of UA. Tashinori righted himself in mid-air and kept his perception and speed high. Now able to move in ways to counter or avoid the bouncing force the villain had put on the ground. He then sprinted over and picked up Lebrava, running at super speed to keep track of Gentle's flight and surprising the girl. How? How can you move this fast with me and I don't feel pain from the air friction? Tashinori shrugs and holds the girl tight to himself as he finally catches up to where Gentle was landing. Well isn't that convenient? Tashinori says as Gentle lands in the ocean. The ocean next to Dagaba Beach. The villain sputters and swims to the shore with Lebrava there to meet him. My dear, how did? Oh, never mind. I see, he says with a few coughs while trying to catch his breath. Tashinori smiles as Lebrava helps Gentle to stand before taking this time to stop and talk with the man. I know a bit of why you want to attack or rather just infiltrate UA. You wish to become notable, to be recognized and capable in some way. Yes, Gentle looks down before asking how much the true meta hero knew. I only know about your past at UA, and how you were expelled and what caused you to fall on terrible times in despair. And while part of me wants to just knock you out, I'd rather hear more from you as a whole. The villains look at Tashinori with some confusion, but they know he basically had them beat. Gentle sighs and removes his cloak as it was sticky from the salt water. He talks about how he strove to become a notable hero, one who could be recognized almost as much as All Might was. But his dreams fell short or rather were shattered thanks to some of his own actions. When I tried to save someone's life, it ended up impeding a hero who was seeking to do the same. And it injured the person we were trying to save. He recounted how his family was held accountable and sued because of his actions, his expulsion and disownment, and living in homelessness until he could find something to stand on. You'd have thought that would have been the worst of it right. No, the part that hurt the most was when I met a former classmate. I congratulated him on becoming a well-known hero, and he didn't remember who I was at all. Gentle teared up at saying that, noting that this was the point he chose to become a villain. If I couldn't become remembered for being a hero, I thought I could gain notoriety as a villain. 
and be remembered like the peerless thief or distro. Toshinori looks down in sadness and disappointment. The latter though was mostly for himself. I didn't concern myself with these things back when I was a pro. I was focused on giving people hope and something to look up to, or something to strive for. He also notes that much of this goes back to what Jotaro had pointed out about the problems with too many powers, and people wanting to use them at an opportune times. You aren't the only problem in this situation. You, you sought what so many who go into the hero business do, to become a legend or a hero that can inspire others. It's imperfect, but it is better than others who only become heroes for money or fame. It was precisely that aspect that the peerless thief opposed, Toshinori says with a comforting hand on Gentle's shoulder. He then notes that there could be another way for Gentle to do some good and be a kind of hero, and that his crimes were not the same kind of serious that would warrant arrest. To be honest, you're more of a nuisance or a person disturbing the peace, much less sinister compared to someone like Shigaraki or what Stain used to be, Toshinori said with an extended hand. Gentle took it and asked what the hero intended to do. I'm going to make a call. I've been in contact with a few individuals who could make use of your and other skills. It wouldn't be hero work or anything like that. At least not right away. Hearing this stuns the two villains. They were certain the true meta-hero would cart them off to prison after knocking them out. Are you? Are you serious? Labrava exclaims while looking between Tashinori and Gentle, the latter of whom gulps before asking what he had in mind. Tashinori pulled out his phone and called up someone special. Tenzin. This is a bit surprising. What can I do for you? I was hoping to talk with you about a matter Principal Nezu. Something involving a few special cases. Tashinori says to the bewilderment of the two before him. And it continues as Tashinori outlines his idea and the options to the three people involved. With Nezu approving rapidly after noting, it could be so much fun. And thus, Gentle Criminal and Lebrava's infiltration of UA was stopped. With the creation of a special group to aid in the protection of the public and instructing of others about what it means to be a hero. But that is a story for later. Back at UA, each of the students were finishing their preparations for the festival. So, are you ready for that? Play Monoma put together. Jutero said with a barely covered chuckle. But it turns to a yelp when Itsuka pinches his side. Her cheeks were puffed as she told him to worry about his own show. Though given how well you sing and play, I don't think you'll have much to worry about. Itsuka says with a hip bump. Jutero chuckles before saying they should be good. Izuku, you sure you can handle pulling Ayama up with those tendrils of yours? Mina questions as the team does a few practice tosses. All good, let's give them a great show. The teams finish tuning and preparing till the time for their performance is at hand. At 10 a.m., the lights in the auditorium quickly turn on to show all of Class 1A, and then quickly cut out. Let's get this started, Jutero says before tossing his drumsticks into the air and then generating a few Kai orbs to detonate in the air for some opening fireworks. Right at the last one's detonate, he starts drumming and the rest of the band follows suit, with Gyro singing her heart out after thanking those attending and the performance is on. As the song plays, the dancers keep everyone hyped and dancing along, and at just the right time, Izuku tosses Aoyama high into the air and the French boy uses his laser to create even more flashy light effects. He is caught by Ajiro, and then put inside of a large mirror ball Izuku quickly prepared. Saffentite steps forward and dances in a way that excites everyone in the audience and uses her magic to create glittering streamers throughout the hall. Shoto with the help of Kirishima then creates a somewhat snow globe-like effect through the building. As the show keeps going on, Achako and others from want to pull others into the air to join in their dances, including Yuri, Carmen, and Ernesto who were brought by Pedro, Mirio, and Tamaki, who float around and laugh with each other between the sparkles of magic Saffentite was creating and Momo creates a few confetti cannons and some harmless fireworks add to it. When the song ends, the students of one are met with standing ovations and jubilation, even by those who didn't attend the concert itself. When Jutero and the others from one are met with Pedro and the rest to ask what they thought of the show, it was Kualo. The way Lumen Boy flew in the air and made those flashes, and all the sparkles, and music was great. Each of the children say with smiles on their faces, waving their hands while thinking about the show. Jutero laughs and pats Iri on the head before saying, Glad you had fun, kiddo. Izuku and the others agree and a few show them some affection as well, with Izuku having a surprise for Iri and the other two. Me and Sato work to make a few of these. Hope you like them, he says before pulling out a couple of candy apples and handing them to the children, and each of the children happily dig in. Ugh, oh, you're going to spoil your lunch, Tamaki says with a pitch in his voice. Mirio and Pedro laugh at Tamaki's panic and thank Class 1 for the exciting performance. I don't know about the rest of you, but I want to explore more of the festival. Pedro says with a smile before taking the free hand of Ernesto to explore more of the exhibits. The rest from one and decide to explore themselves, though a couple decide to watch the mishmash of stories 1B was doing for their exhibit. Well that was, something, Safentite said with a confused smirk on her face. Itsuka rolled her eyes and asked Safi if she could make her a dress for the pageant. No matter how many Mei or Kanoko make, they can't hold up when I get serious. Itsuka exclaims while heading toward the contest stage. Safi laughs and quickly makes something that could handle what the girl could do. It doesn't look too dissimilar to the other dresses she'd had made, but the genie girl showed it could take quite a lot of stress. Okay then, 
Hopefully I'll be able to show my kind of beauty with this. I'm certain you will, both of you. Jitaro said from a food stand the girls were passing by. He was munching on some tayaki with a smirk as Itsuka's face turned a bit red and she called him an idiot. Safi though just laughed and said, I hope you enjoy the shows. The four. Well you know, Jitaro nods and acknowledges what she means. In the backstage of the pageant, each of the girls was changing to fit their appeals. Itsuka had a deep blue dress that hugged her body and left her shoulders exposed. Safentite had gone for a red dress that covered much of her blue skin, but that was only one part of what she had planned. Baibimi had her usual ostentatious kimono, and Nejire had a dress that was a seafoam green color. One of the last to arrive though was Melissa. She also had a dress on, but it appeared a bit simpler than the other girls. It was a silver color with red lines along some of the stitching and looped up over one shoulder. Really? That is how you intended to compete? Rather simple, isn't it? By Bimmy asked. Oh, you'll see what I have in mind. Melissa says with a smirk. The support course upperclassmen turned up her nose before telling the rest to show their best. Not that it can compete with me, she exclaims as she takes the first act of appeals. With a strange parade on the catwalk with a machine modeled after her face. Jotaro and a few other boys raised their eyebrows at this. Though in his case it was in confusion. Okay, that was weird. And that's saying something from this world, he remarked as the golden machine made its way down the catwalk. Manga tried to talk up the student, but he was getting nowhere. After Baibimi's and a few other girls' appeals, it was time for Itsuka to make her own showing of what it means to be beautiful. She stepped out on the catwalk and took a bit of what she learned from Yuabami to show off that way first, and then took her stance and channeling her kai to her hands. A set of stone tablets are brought up and she starts chopping through them all, or rather slicing clean through them in an almost elegant dance. Flashes of teal kai showing as she moved and struck, widening the eyes of everyone watching at seeing kai for the first time except for Jotaro who were more focused on her movements. The pervs watching her breasts as they bounced with her movements. Jotaro though saw her movements as a dance all her own as she copied his stance to channel large amounts of kai. And she used that to pull large amounts of kai to her center and make it grow and grow. Until it was a massive sphere she was holding above her head. Rather than throwing it like Jotaro would do, she pushed the orb upwards before taking her next stance. Holding her left fingers in front of her face and her other hand toward the ground. She breathed deeply as she felt the energy moving through and around her once again. Though everyone else was worried about the giant orb she made coming back towards them. Rui Jingo Bang. Hitsuka shouts before thrusting her fingers upward into the orb, launching it up in the air and then detonating into a variety of colors above the audience, garnering oohs and ahs from the observers, and a minor eye twitch from a certain upperclassman. Nejire compliments Hitsuka and tells her that she intends to match her flash as well. After Nejire finished flying through the sky and making her rose, she landed with a grace that many compared to a fairy. Safentite smiled before adjusting her hair. She had it currently in a bun but that was part of what she would show as she walked out. She strutted out with many eyes following the sway of her hips and the way her dress hugged her body, and were stunned as the girl let her hair down and let her midnight locks out, almost giving her hair a shimmer as it cascaded down her back in waves. Safentite caught Jotaro's eye and winked at him. He smiled at that while a few of the other boys acted almost starstruck, especially as she began to dance again, floating in the air much like Nejire had done earlier. But rather than form a shape in the sky, she created arcs and lights to show off her magic and then to add an extra finisher for the show, as she spun and her hair seemed to hide some of her appearance. When she was shown again she was wearing a belly dancer's outfit, making most of the boys' noses erupt in blood. And it got a bit worse as she continued to dance and draw all eyes. Even the girls were affected, with a few who were lesbians having nosebleeds on par with the boys. Not fair. I know what I'm looking up tonight. Hamina, Hamina, Hamina. Is this legal? A few call out while watching the girl dance. Even with the veil she had on, her beguiling eyes sent a few over. It's not like I haven't seen this before, or really here with less on, but I swear, my hormones are running hotter than ever, Jotaro thinks with a gulp, while also planning to apologize to Itsuka later. Unfortunately, this last part of her appeal does get red flagged by the teachers, though Midnight herself compliments the girl she has to ask that Safentite leave the stage, while Baibimi is looking like she had a seizure after seeing the effect the genie girl's performance had on the audience. Melissa shakes her head and takes a breath before stepping up in her own dress. A few in the audience comment that they felt bad for her. Bad enough she doesn't have a flashy quirk or whatever that was the kendo did. But she had to go after that. She's an engineer right. Wonder if she's going to show off a machine of some kind. The blonde engineer taps her glasses before running toward the end of the catwalk. As she was running, her dress was rapidly transforming. Becoming another armor around her as she leapt from the stage and took to the sky. Shocking everyone. Well except her partners. Right as she was high up in the air, her other flight-capable armors joined her. Flying over the crowd and drawing all kinds of attention even from those outside of the pageant stage. As other ran in to watch the spectacle, Melissa started the next phase of her show. She had her heavy arms or overwhelming firepower armor start shooting fireworks into the air. 
first in the red, white, and blue of the USA, and then shifted to shells that looked like all might in the air. Melissa then coordinated with three different armors to skywrite, UA in the air. Time for the finish, she exclaimed as she dive-bombed down into the center of the crowd, with the recently arrived Triple M and Starfall armors joining her. While a few panicked and screamed as the machines rocketed toward them, there were more who were amazed, especially when she quickly pulled out of the dive to rocket above the catwalk. Her armors did the same but didn't go as high and landed, just in time for Melissa's armor to change back into a dress, one that had functioning jets as she landed atop the hands of her two largest armors, while firepower slid in behind and shot more fireworks and the other armors landed in formation. Stunned silence pervaded the area for a few seconds, then it erupted in raucous applause after the shock had worn off a bit. Even her competitors applauded with excitement after her appeal finished. With that done, it was time to cast votes for the victor. And while Monoma tried to butt in, Izuku quickly wrapped him up and pulled him away, giving Itsuka a thumbs up. With the vote cast, Melissa was crowned the winner of the beauty pageant. Itsuka and Nejire meanwhile had tied for second place, and they respected the outcome. She had more than just flash and style. That was what we had, Itsuka said with a slightly bitter smile. Nejire nods and says she showed her own beauty. The beauty of her machines, her intelligence, and creativity. With the biggest events out of the way, the performers and contestants could just enjoy the rest of the festival. With some competing in the obstacle course, others enjoy the other exhibits. Or in some cases the exhibitors enjoy messing with the other classes. Like Bakugo and Shinso scaring Minda and a few others from 1A. A bit thanks to Bakugo using his quirk to make explosive firelights and foe below the wisps. And while some wanted to be impressed by the development studio's match, many considered it a pale copy or imitation of the machines Melissa had built. Which of course drove May to try and quickly build a new machine to compete only for her to be knocked out by power loader using a gadget glove from Melissa. Okay, I like this thing. Any chance I could work with you on improving it and personalizing? The support hero teacher said, and Melissa was happy to help. As the day was winding down, more and more people were talking about how much they enjoyed everything about the festival this year, though some were celebrating more. Namely, Monomize's initial poll showed that Class 1B's play was more liked, until Itsuka came up later and showed that more had found 1A's concert exciting and fun thanks to the students including the audience more especially the little kids who had been laughing and playing in the magical sparkles and lights Saffentite had created. With night falling, most of the students were ready to sleep. Some like Melissa decided to celebrate a bit with Izuku and Achako, who were both impressed and glad that she won over all the others. So you made two big robots and used them for a way to show off. Can't say you aren't fitting into the hero side of things, Achako said with a hip bump. Melissa laughed and readjusted her crown while Izuku looked over her armor. Man, that is so cool how you built this. Can it form into other shapes? Like maybe you could wear it under your clothes. Then you could be ready whenever you needed to be. Or it could, HM. Before Izuku could start on a mumble spree, Melissa caught his lips and asked him to calm down. And not to be outdone, Hachako slipped in next and kissed Melissa and Izuku. Kiss for the winner. And just because, she said with a blush. And the three had a laugh as they went to the one of dorms to relax and maybe celebrate a bit. Jotaro meanwhile had caught Itsuka before heading home. That really is a great color and looks on you. Though I won't deny. The sports bra look is quite nice too. You perf. Itsuka says with an elbow and a playful slap. She smiles up at him before kissing him. You apologized about your eyes being glued to Safi during her. But frankly, I don't even blame you. I gotta be honest. I got a bit hot and bothered watching her appeal as well, the redhead said before her face matched her hair. Jotaro laughed and said Safentite did have fun messing with people and making the most of her sex appeal especially if she could take some people off guard. This got a laugh out of his girlfriend, and they parted with another kiss. Once Jotaro was back in his room though, he took a deep breath before punching in a code to his and Safentite shared space. Once there he went to one of the living space areas before speaking. You totally did that just to get me hot and bothered, as well as maybe a bit jealous, he said with a look toward the corner. And Safentite stepped out with a sheer one piece on and nothing else. Felt like the best way to get you back to me. If only for a little while, she said before stepping up and kissing her partner is then fell back onto the couch for the night. No POV. The morning after the school festival, Tamura and Sasaku were fuming. Why didn't anything happen? The blue-haired man raged while scratching at his neck. Sasaku asked the same before questioning Mandla about the problems with the plan. The plan should have gone off without a hitch. Unless, oh no, Mandla said before checking his books once more. He read over a few tomes before finding a few pieces that worry him. I think I found the reason the potions failed. Or rather, it hasn't gone properly active. Manla notes that something must have happened to expose the vials to new liquid substances. Thanks to that, the concoctions had to mix and then stabilize before they could create something new. With effects I can't control, but they shouldn't have been possible. The instructions were to store the materials in the development studio. Like usual, Natalie exclaims while running her hands through her hair. The others who had returned to the penthouse were only somewhat listening. But Magni had her own thoughts before saying, maybe this had something to do with it. She then showed her phone and a few photos some people posted while at the festival. 
and the fact that the development studio had been cordoned off. Not sure our gift had anything to do with it, but they apparently had to move things from the development labs. Maybe our packages were part of it. Nan hums before asking for the phone. He creates a quick magic circle and pulls the image out and into the penthouse. I could just use holograms to give us a look. Wu says with an annoyed look at the mage. Yeah, but we can't really interact with those. What are you? How are we here? Wu questioned before realizing that the group was now in a perfect duplicate of the hallway shown in the image. One they could walk in and around. Minor superimposing of space based on the image extracted. It's relatively easy once you figure it out, Manla says offhandedly. The leaders each take a look and see some of the damage and even into some of the interior of the space. Whistle with this amount of damage, they couldn't store anything here. This would require a lot of rebuilding, Natalie says with some respect for the damage caused. And they need to move the materials to a new location, if they weren't damaged in the explosion. So they could expose it to who knows what kinds of outside sources. Nain says with a shrug. Twice meanwhile questions whose bright idea the whole plan was. Tamira though is less impressed and again demanding to know what happened to their magic plague. It's likely that the potions are changing and becoming something different from the original plan. The effects will be random or they will be similar to what we originally intended. Hard to say, the mage says with a scratch of his chin before letting up the modified space. The head of the League of Villains lets out another annoyed breath before asking, so what do we do? We lost our best chance to show how pathetic UAS security is as well as catching a bunch of those mobs and NPCs in a magic plague. Natalie thinks for a moment before noting that it still could prove useful. Even if it goes off later, we'll still get our bit of chaos. And who knows what else could happen with it. This could be more of a windfall than we think. The luck manipulator's reasoning doesn't make Tamura less angry. But it does temper his annoyance for the time being. Back at UA, Jotaro was waking up next to Saphantite. Neither one of them wearing a stitch of clothing. Haven't done that for a while. Jutero says while rolling out of bed. Saffentite smiled at him while pushing herself up to look at her partner, and her blue bosoms being shown on clear display to him. Are you really complaining? Jutero gives Saffentite a gentle smile before leaning down to kiss her once more. No, but, we should talk to Itsuka about this. You brought it up before, and I agree. We should tell everyone who we really are. But we should wait till I'm recharged. Speaking of, I wonder why I'm not back to full yet. Saffentite hums before uncovering herself and then magicking on lab coat and other clothes. Well why don't we check you over? Let's head to the lab and take a look, she says with a shrug. Jotaro nods and they head for the lab section of their space to examine his energy levels. It takes a few minutes, but Saffentite gets a reading to explain what was going on. You are recharging, but it's taking longer than usual because you aren't exposed to the same levels and types you're used to. Jotaro hums while getting dressed before saying, you're talking about extreme levels of ambient gamma and other types of radiation right. Saffentite nods and notes that while Jotaro was getting his strength back, it would take much longer compared to their old world. After all, he did leave those ah, uh, while radioactive zones back home, she notes with an eyebrow raised before shifting to a more sympathetic look. A larger hero sighs before saying, guess I just get to be more human for a bit longer. It'll at least give me a chance to get Ajiro's Kai training really started. With that, they each take their portals back to their dorm rooms, and get ready for the next days of classes, which was quite boring compared to the last few weeks of classes. But for some, they were excited for what was to come. So, I've seen how you and Kendo do this. But is that the only way to channel or absorb Kai? Ajiro asked in the forest training area. Sort of. I think, I'm not an absolute expert, but I do know how energy works better than most. For the time being, you need to figure out the link to Kai in your body. Jutero explains before gesturing to sit and meditate. Ajiro follows his lead and does just that. He calms his mind and listens to what Jutero says while they meditate. Feel the flow of energy. Sense how it all moves around you. Like how Midoriya feels the kinetic energy all around him to cool or heat things. Ajiro muses while feeling the flow of the wind around him. While he was taking his first steps into the realms of Kai, Itsuka was practicing with Aizawa, both looking to refine their own Kai attacks. I suspected it was probably the case, but I really can't cancel out your Kai. At least not with my quirk. But my interception or interruption blows might be able to. Let's test the theory, Itsuka said while creating her Kai blades on her hands. Aizawa takes his own stance before letting the Kai flow to his hands. While Itsuka looked to have teal blades or extensions on her hands, Aizawa's now had an appearance closer to that of knuckle dusters. Wonder if you inspired that, old man. Aizawa thought to himself before clashing with Itsuka. The fight was a bit more even than one might believe. While Aizawa did have more experience in true combat, Itsuka was more experienced with Kai, even if only slightly. So even when Aizawa's blows did interrupt her flow to her hands, she could easily adjust and give Aizawa some solid kicks that were imbued with Kai even giving him a Rui Jengu bang hit with her fingers extended and basically pinning him to a wall. Okay, that worked pretty well for you. Can you let me down? He asked with a wince from the pressure on his chest. Itsuka chuckled before releasing her technique. As fun as this is though, I see what Jotaro meant about getting too used to or dependent on it, she mused after Aizawa returned. He nodded and noted it was no different from what they try to teach at UA. 
A hero can't be one note when it comes to their abilities, even if their quirk alone is rather one note. Aizawa acknowledges his dependence on his own quirk and how it disrupts enemies who all want to use their quirks, but it often leaves me at the mercy of heteromorphs. That's part of why I build my capture cloth style, given it let me leverage against generally larger villains of that quirk type. Itsuka then notes that it did him little good against her, Melissa, or Saffrontite. So now you have to think far beyond what your quirk limited you to. Not something most with quirks would ever think they'd have to worry about. Given we didn't know about true metas or even magic before all of this, Itsuka mused while practicing with her gadgets. The insomniac teacher agrees and asks if he could borrow some of the tools she was using. While the various martial artists were practicing, the others of the hero courses were trying to improve themselves in various ways. From mine to working with Bondo and Iber even more on captures and field awareness, to Izuku and some of the other stress testing gear Melissa made. This is a big help. Thanks guys, Melissa said after the hard heads had been attacking a pair of shields she made. One physical and attached to a gadget glove, the other energy based for her main tech might suit, to be applied to the other units, and for a new special idea suit, a pure defensive variant. Hiroshima questioned after finishing the tests. Melissa nodded and said she got the idea from him, Tetsu Tetsu, and the incident where she was buried in a cave-in. Sometimes, even the fastest heroes can't get everyone away. So, I thought of making a unit that can either take a lot of punishment or could create a shield that protects everyone. Melissa said while minimizing and installing the energy shield modules on her other armors. Tetsu then questions why she didn't just go with attachable versions for her main suit. Too risky. Even if I have them built for a specific purpose, they might not be as effective as a unit dedicated to a specific purpose. Besides, they could be ripped apart or intercepted if I'm calling them from a distance. She notes that it was easier to use a specific suit for the mission at hand and have a spare elsewhere if necessary. That way I can be ready for almost anything and not have to worry about the units breaking as easily. And umph, before Melissa could start on another ramble, Izuku caught her and kissed her. Let's not worry about work right now. How about we call it a day? He said with a smile directed her way. While the guys were blushing a bit, they could also agree that they could use the break. Kaminari's already shorted out, and I'm a bit overheated. Even with my ice, I need to cool off. Todoroki said. Melissa clears her throat and agrees. Thanks for helping test my gear. This will be better for when trouble comes our way, she says while checking the systems and internal temp of her fire rescue armor she had Todoroki testing. Noting the internal temp was alright, but some of the exterior equipment was damaged. A few days later, Ajiro had begun to feel some of the links to Kai, evidenced by him pulling some energy into his hands and tail. Good, now we just need to build around your fighting style, though we might also focus on more traditional martial arts, Jutero said before taking a stance. The two sparred and Ajiro got a feel for some of what Jutero was talking about, especially when the larger team turned his tail attacks against him. I do practice martial arts, but I don't think I'm at yours or Kendo's level. Ajiro laments after getting knocked around for the fifth time. Then we need to adjust your style a bit. Even if you are using your tail, your style does seem similar to those who use kick combat. We just need to work with it and around it a bit. Jutero says before calling Saffentite, who then does a bit of magic to temporarily remove Ajiro's quirk. Whoa, I didn't know this was possible. He exclaimed after the magic was done. Saffentite made him a new pair of pants before saying, it's just temporary. Don't want people to think I'm discriminating or anything. But this could get you to understand the fundamentals of fist styles a bit easier and give Jotaro an easier way to train you. The formerly tailed teen nods before bowing to Jotaro, who returns it before taking a southern shaolin stance for brute force blows. He walks Ajiro through a few of the different forms and styles, as well as some kickboxing, taekwondo, and joint lock styles. During this, Ajiro gets a better feel for the energy and Kai around him, as well as finding specific styles easier for him to channel Kai through, namely, Mantis and Wing Chun. Jutero noted at this point that his Kai took on a yellow flame-like hue. Compared to Itsuka's teal blades or waves, Aizawa's muted electric state, and his own mixture of white, red, and blue hues that had volcanic properties to them. Still can't imagine a full technique though. But it doesn't actually feel hot though, the trainee comments while throwing a few punches and palm strikes. He then tries a kick but seems to be having a problem with the channeling. HM, listen, kicks are really no different than your tail strikes. But try using it that way. Ajiro takes Jutero's advice and practices a few times finally getting after about 15 attempts. Nice, huh, I wonder, Ajiro says before doing a heel drop kick with his kai flowing through it. He then shifted his weight and then rotated into a spinning uppercut kick that seemed to surround him and fire. Okay, that was awesome, Ajiro exclaims before his tail bursts back out of his pants. Jutero chuckles before asking if Ajiro could do it again with his tail. The now-tailed teen nodded before shifting his weight a bit before doing his flame heel kick once more, and then he takes his spinning uppercut kick to a new level where he imbues his leg and then tail and Kai making more of a flame tornado. Jutero nodded before asking if he thought of a name. Um, how about flame tail dance? For the spin kicks, tail attack. And maybe burn heel. 
As for my punches, maybe heat blows or burst bombs. Ajiro muses while practicing the techniques. The larger martial artist's next question was if he could make some launchable Kai blasts. I'll try, was all Ajiro said while trying to make some Kai orbs in his palms, but couldn't come up with anything. Well, let's leave it at that for now. It's a good start if nothing else, Titero said with a chuckle before bowing to Ajiro. From outside their field of view, someone else was watching. That being Mina who was looking on intently, though she wasn't focused on trying to learn Kai from the way the two practiced. She was instead watching Jotaro and feeling uneasy about what he said to her about what her drive was. What it was, I really wanted. I mean, yeah I thought he was cool, inspiring, and powerful before. But now he's normal so to speak and it's got me more interested. And I don't know why. The pink girl muses this before heading back to the locker rooms to change. She sighs as she considers if she was really just wanting to learn Kai to improve her skills. Or if she wanted some reason to get closer to the strange teen who could leave an imprint on a mountain. Even when he didn't have any true superpowers at the time. These thoughts don't stop even a day after she watched Ajiro learn to harness the power of Kai. And as Aizawa was discussing a special training exercise the students would be doing later in the week. Given the nature of things now, as well as the risk of new incidents, the principal has thought to organize a special training session in a few of the battlegrounds here. That being a massive joint training operation, Aizawa said before bringing up a few images of the battlegrounds. He explained that Nezu had thought of training operation using all of the Hero Corps students with some of the support course as well aiding them. On the other hand, volunteers from the general and business courses would be acting as live victims. Aizawa notes, they want to give each of you and your upperclassmen more of a taste for what these types of situations could entail. Bank robberies, a collapsing building, even an average villain attack. So that will be the assignment. I hope you've each improved enough. A few of the students are excited for the chance to work with their upperclassmen and show what they could do. Some more than others. This is our chance to show some of what Kai can do. And it could give some hope to those who don't have quirks that strengthen them or more importantly the quirkless themselves. I agree Mashiro, but you still need to figure out your own way to fight at a distance. Itsuka says while trading blows with the tailed teen, though she was impressed by his heat tail slam and the flame tail tornado, where she could also take advantage of this given he was still being dependent on his tail alone. Try mixing up your techniques and using your fists more, she instructs before mixing up her kicks, punches, chops, and then a storm fist blast. And after a stunning strike, she created a tempest blast and dropping it on top of Ajiro. And while knocked back quite a distance, Ajiro is relatively unharmed. Okay, I was sure that would break a lot of bones. Ajiro grunted while pulling himself out of the crater from the blast. Itsuka laughs before saying, Jotaro mentioned this once, but basically a Kai user generates or slightly creates a barrier around themselves when they've at least learned to harness the power. Doesn't stop it from hurting though. The redhead winces while thinking back on the pain in her hand from the first time she unleashed a Kai attack. The two kept working and trying to help Ajiro unlock some kind of ranged Kai attack only to come up with nothing by the time of the massive joint training operation. Nezu raised his hand and welcomed all of the students of the all the courses gathered. Thank you all for coming one and all, especially those of general and business courses who have agreed to be the civilians in this operation. This exercise is for the future of all the potential heroes and even those of the support course, as we will be seeing how well all of the students can work with one another and other heroes. Ironjiki raises his hand and asks why they were doing this. We did similar for the provisional license exam after all. So why are we doing this again? Nezu nods and notes that the 1B rep was correct. But this time we'll be doing more specific challenges and team-ups for each of you. After noting that, he pointed out that the students from the other courses would be more random versions of the HUC people from the exam. While it is true that the HUC are judges for the exams, civilians are never as composed as they often are during emergencies. Thus, we have some of the most random and often stupid groups to portray crowds, teenagers. After hearing this, a few students rage or complain, one more explosively than the rest. Back on task, we'll have each of you go into the battlegrounds and then you'll have to respond to the emergencies. Envelopes are being passed around to each student. Inside they have a card that notes the battleground you have to go to. Follow those and be ready for the incidents coming your way. With a clap, Nezu dismisses the students and tells them good luck. Jotaro opens his envelope and notes that he was in Group 2 and Battleground Alpha. So, what have you got? Izuku asks before noting he was in Group 1 and Battleground Beta. Jotaro compares and notes that it could be interesting to see what would happen in the training areas. Given this is in cities, we could be looking at something like a robbery or a villain rampage. Or it could even be a collapsing building. That would mumble, mutter. Izuku starts while walking to meet with some of the other students. His classmates sweat drop at seeing this before shaking their heads to move on. Izuku eventually gets snapped out of it by a different member of the third year class. With a quick zap, Izuku was snapped back to reality by Heya Yuyu from class 3A. Nejire and Mirio mention that you tend to overthink things, but I didn't realize it was quite like that, the girl says with a chuckle. Izuku rubbed the back of his head before asking who she was and what her quirk was. After that, he asked about a few others in the team he was thrown together with. That included Minta, Momo, Awase, and Yui. So, any thoughts on what we'll be up against Midoriya? Yeah, Yurazu. 
Mind asked while walking to the battleground. Momo shrugged and said, It's difficult to say, and that is likely the point, though I'm more concerned about who we could be facing in these exercises. Izuku agrees and notes, We aren't up against upperclassmen given they are right here with us, and even though the teachers are pros, they couldn't handle all of us. From class 2A, another student had their own thoughts. They might have called in some other pros for this, ones who may have lighter workloads or could be spared. OBTW, I'm Fuamuwata. You guys are in Eraserhead's class right. The one of students acknowledged that and she let out a strained chuckle before saying, it probably pretty rough. I remember what that was like. After all, he did expel all of us barely an hour into starting classes at UA. And at all of the first years wide-eyed and concerned. Minda bluntly asked how they were still at UA if they'd been expelled by Eraserhead. He wasn't actually planning to expel us. Or rather he did it so we'd face death and try to grow from the whole experience. Nuwata explained while looking down in some sadness. Another from class 2 has shouted that they were still mad about it given they all now had black mark on their records. The one of students let out muffled huzz at that statement and consider what it meant that all of them were allowed to stay at UA and not experience that. Momo thought it over a bit before coming to her own conclusion. Maybe, he saw some greater potential in all of us. Though he did seem to have a problem with Jotaro and Midoriya given he can't cancel them out. Probably, though he might be more appreciative of Jotaro now, given what he's been teaching Aizawa. Not to mention Ajiro and Kendo, Minda says with a slight shrug. The upperclassmen they'll look at the first years funny before asking what he meant. The first years each share a look before Izuku says, you'll probably see in the next battle. I know Jotaro is in the second set, and I overheard Ajiro and Kendo are there too. Yu then tells the rest to get ready as they were at the training ground. The cityscape before them seemed to be in slight ruin but there was nothing that stood out. Something feels off. Yeyurazu. Izuku says with a nod to the onyx-haired girl. While some of the upperclassmen try to tell him to wait or follow their lead, Yuyu and Nuwata were willing to listen for the moment. Momo makes a long-range listening device before some of the second years that had more surveillance-style quirks start listening in and trying to figure out what could be happening. Only to pick up on crashes of windows or the faint sounds of walls breaking to report some of what was happening. Which one is the furthest away? Izuku demands with a serious look. A dog like second year is off put, but the look Izuku was giving her was enough to refocus. I think it's that way about 20 blocks. Based on the sense and sounds I'm picking up. Good enough. I'll handle that one. You take care of the others. Izuku says while charging up his power and blasting away. A beetle-headed member of Tua said, he can't be thinking he can do it alone. Minda and the other first years smirked before Nyanjiki said, if it's Midoriya, he definitely can. And to prove that right, Izuku is currently floating above a wrecked foe bank, with three villains having broken in. Well, that's cliché. And wait, is that Death Arms and Kamui Woods? And, wait who's the other one? Izuku thought while taking stock of the situation. Both of the known pros had modified versions of their usual hero costumes. Some extra spikes or thorns, darker colors, and full face covering masks. But the third member was an odd one to Izuku. He wore a black and orange jumpsuit and seemed to be teleporting in and out of the bank with bags. He had orange hair as well with black highlights to contrast with his blue eyes. Nothing ventured. Here we go. Izuku thought aloud before flying down to engage the trio of villains, quickly punching Da in the face and sending him rolling. Don't think it's that simple. Blacker chain pry guck. Kamui started before Izuku was on him and flip kicked the man in the chin. But the boy was hit in the back by an energy attack of some kind. Not bad. But let's see if you can keep up with me. The strange third member said before creating some orbs and chucking them at Izuku, each with random effects. One coated Izuku in tar and got him stuck to the side of a building, which gave the man a chance to wake up the others and try to get away with the money. Izuku shook his head before focusing on cooling the tar so he could break free easier. You're not getting away that easy. He shouted before unleashing a few Delaware smashes to destabilize the getaway car, eventually overturning it. Kamui took the chance to pull himself and death arms out of the truck while the new man teleported out of sight right above Izuku to drop down and punch the boy in the face. Have some egg on your face. He shouted before creating a few more orbs and slamming them into Izuku's face before teleporting away. The orbs this time unleashed a decent-sized concussive blast which rattled Izuku's head. Well that was sloppy. Okay, let's try this a different way. Izuku thinks aloud before closing his eyes and reaching out with his kinetic sight as he'd taken to calling it. Feeling the active molecules around and picking up on Death Arms and Kamui's movements. I can vaguely make out that other guy's signature, and he's the first one to beat. Izuku thinks while reaching out with his kinetic connections, acting when he felt a strange ripple in the energy around the top of a building, jetting towards the rooftop with some power from venting extra energy. The orange villain reappeared about where Izuku suspected and had a shocked look on his face when Izuku was suddenly right in front of him, and punching him in the face hard enough to knock him back and out, as well as off the top of the building. Shit, Izuku said before making a black whip and catching the strange person and then trying to track down the other two, quickly floating after them and catching them both in black whips. Maybe I should look at using this a bit more. Just need to figure out the best way to control it. 
If you'd like help in that young man, I'd be more than happy to assist, Kamui said while restrained as Izuku continued to float upward and take the three back to the starting zone. While he had been doing that, Minta and Nyernjiki were dragged along by the beetle-headed student and a third year to engage a few looting a store. Minta grumbles about being stuck with all guys, but he works with Nyernjiki for something special he'd been working on. Great buckler, you got it from here mines, the short student said after filling up two hubcabs with his orbs. Nyernjiki smiles before saying, yeah, take this. The teen tosses the two bucklers at the villains, and right as they were about to dodge he engaged the second impact and they were stuck with sticky souvenirs that slowed them down enough for the other two to catch the villains. The pair repeated this a few more times, while the upperclassmen made sure their opponents couldn't escape. That worked pretty well man. High five, Mina said with an outstretched hand to Nyernjiki. He gave a nervous chuckle before returning it. Too bad we didn't have Yui here as well. She could have made the objects you stuck to grow. It'd really make sure they couldn't run, he said before checking his comlink. Speaking of Yui, she was with Miwata, Momo, and the dog-like girl to catch another group of villains. And instead of using random objects around her, Momo created some items with her quirk to better trap or stop the escaping villains. You two make a really good team when you think about it. It certainly makes our jobs a bit easier. Miwata says before using her fluff quirk to reduce the impact of an attacker. And then the dog girl bit down on the shoulder of the villain to pull him back. Finishing the fight with a punch to the face. We've got more trouble though. Incoming. She says with a gesture to the sky. Coming from above are a couple of villains with jetpacks. But they are also quickly caught thanks to Momo making a cannon to launch nets. And Yui making said nets expand rapidly to startle the villains. Some thought the villains could pass right through but Yui then reverses her quirk and shrinks down the nets for the capture. In a different section Yui and Awase with a few third years and a second year are also trying to slow and stop the test villains. With Yu using her electric arrows to stun some of their opponents and a waste rushed in to knock them to the ground and then weld them down. Behind you, a sunglasses wearing second year said before moving his glasses and producing an eye beam blast, saving a waste from getting ambushed by another villain. The other two third years meanwhile focused on tracking the escaping enemies, eventually capturing all of them with robots arriving to act as police to arrest the villains. Back at the entrance, all of the students were surprised to see Izuku floating in the air while keeping his three villains restrained. Nice work Midoriya, you got three by yourself, Minus said with a thumbs up. Yeah, and one is a bit interesting. In fact, I'm pretty sure he could escape in a time, Izuku said while keeping his eye on the orange-suited man, who just smirked before saying, indeed I can kid. He then teleported out of Izuku's black whips and next to a lamppost. All of the students took ready stances to fight the teleporter, only to be surprised when he created an energy orb and was tossing it up and down in his hand. Izuku narrowed his eyes a bit before asking who the man was. Name's Kaiken Kamatero, and I think you can guess what I am kid, the now named Kaiken says with a raised eyebrow at Izuku. He nods slowly before saying, you're a true meta aren't you? Kaiken acknowledged he was, but he wasn't looking to be a hero or villain. I only agreed to do this because the president of the hero commission offered to pay me a bit more. Frankly, I'm just a salary man. This shocks every one of the quirked hero students, as they saw a man who had powers beyond what most of theirs could even do, and he wanted nothing to do with the quirked battles happening every day. Izuku smiles before saying, just because you have powers doesn't mean you want them, or even want to use them. Some just enjoy a simple life or things. Kaiken smiles back before stretching his back out and saying they all pass the trial. Now go and watch the others. Something tells me it could be interesting. Before they leave though, Izuku asked why there weren't any students acting as civilians in their battleground. Oh that. This was designed around an idea of an evacuated city or similar and you were to engage looters and the like. Probably the simplest of the challenges. The students of the ground alpha battle shrugged before heading out. With Izuku leaving Kamui in death arms with a robot. The group made it to an observation room and saw a different image on the screens. Namely ground beta seemed to have more of a mass villain rampage with civilians in danger. Where Jotaro, Kendo, and Ajiro were engaging various villains with Mirio and a few other upperclassmen as well as Sato and Jiroda, while Ground Omega had a forest fire going and the students had to rescue some civilians and try to put out the fire. But in Ground Gamma, just as Mina and a few of the others were arriving, the potions started bubbling and stabilizing, ready to unleash a large burst of chaos. No POV. As Ajiro was walking into Ground Beta, he felt a tension he didn't fully understand. What is this? It's not like fear or panic. It almost feels like excitement, he thinks while his twitch is a bit behind him. One of the upperclassmen notices this and try to pep talk Ajiro assuming he was nervous about the operation. Hey don't worry, you've got plenty of us with you. And while your quirk isn't flashy, from what I've heard you're pretty capable with it. Though I'm a bit worried about those two, a bubble-haired second year said to him, gesturing to Itsuka and Jotaro with some unease. Ajiro looks at him funny before asking, what do you mean? You know how strong Jotaro is. The second year nods and says, well yeah when he's all powered up. 
but I've heard about him being drained and brought down to normal human levels, and Kendo doesn't have a quirk anymore. The slightly older teen shakes his head before commenting that he didn't think those without quirks could really do much in some situations, noting that Itsuka would eventually run out of tools and gadgets, and that whatever holo or energy projectors can't do that much. For her or Jutero, the tailed teen scowls at the upperclassmen and walks off. So this is some of what Midoriya and the others had to hear constantly. Well then, we'll just have to show them all what you two, and I, can really do. Mirio had been watching and shook his head at the what the junior had said. This could be a bit of trouble going forward. Oh well, I'll just have to show enough power to keep up and bridge the gaps. And maybe change some minds, he said with a new fire burning in his eyes. Once they reached the battleground, the heroes all noted that some of the students from the other courses were walking the streets, almost akin to what would be normal in the city. Hey is that Shinso? Itsuka asks while narrowing her eyes. Ajiro and Jutero look and note that it was him. They approached the indigo-haired teen and asked what he was doing in the training ground. I'm not sure on the details, but Principal Nezu just told us to come here before the hero students. Maybe it's... As he was speaking, the ground shook and a roar was heard. The business course students screamed and started running away from a group of villains. Oh, that's what this is about. I get it. Let's move. Jutero says before running toward the danger and over the fleeing civilians. The rest of the hero course students follow his lead and run towards the sounds of the villains attacking. When they arrive, one student was about to be attacked by a hero wearing armor, and had mufflers coming out of his arms. No you don't, guy a wave. Jutero shouted before punching the ground and blasting him back. And before the armored attacker can recover, Jutero is on him quickly with a rampage straight. To his face. That breaks not just the armor but sends his opponent right through a wall. The second ears were dumbfounded by this and it was compounded when Itsuka and Ajiro stepped up to use their own techniques. Ken no Nami. Itsuka shouts before launching two blade waves forward and they actually went further than before. Once that was done, she charged in with her Naimoto no Ken, Teifu Hashi combo to knock around or cut the gear of a few of the enemies. Ajiro meanwhile evaded before attacking with his tail and fist before changing up with his Kai techniques, with Flame Tail Dance sending multiple enemies flying. Hey now, don't let the underclassmen show us up. Show these villains your power, Mirio exclaims before using Phantom Menace to attack some of the groups of enemies. Juro to follow suit and minorly turns into a beast to fight back. While a few do want to fight back, some of the hero students note that the civilians were in the crossfire or blast radius. We'll get these people clear. Just keep the villains off of us, the bubble or afro-haired second year says, before using his quirk to make a canopy to cover the general course students. A few others follow his lead and do just that, evacuating the civilians so the more direct combat-capable students could fight freely. I thought it was some kind of gear or gadget Kendo was using. Apparently not. How are they doing that? We can ask them later. Many shout while clearing out the other students. Between Mirio, the Kai users, Jurota, and a few others they mop up most of the villains that were attacking. Those who were still around the challenge is over. Not yet it's not. A new person booms out. That being Mount Lady who kicks a large amount of debris toward the teens and civilians. Faith's shield. Ibera shouts before creating a mass of vines to try and protect her partners. But even then, some of the stones blast through. So those who could hit the stones hard enough did to protect everyone. Zutero unleashed as many storm fist blasts as he could. Itsuka did the same but also mixed in her Ken no Nami or blade waves. Ajiro still couldn't use ranged Kai, so he just focused on breaking what he could with his fists, kicks, and tail. Mirio did much the same and would permeate into the ground and walls to come up or across where he predicted the stones would fly. Just a bit more. We just need to deal with her and we should be done. Then I'll finish this. Jiro to shots before going full beast and charging Mount Lady who smirks before saying, like that'll work against me. She gets under his attack, punches the boy in the face, and then Pyle drives him into the ground. After I got beat by that size shifter from the Forgotten, I went back to the basics and relearned to fight. The giant hero's declaration makes those who are still around nervous, especially those who don't have his capable combat quirks. But the Kai users and Mirio don't let it intimidate them. Jutero goes first and uses his prismatic burst to knock her back. Or try to. While it did impact her hard, it wasn't enough to really take the hero playing villain down and she still had some allies. Crap, what do we do? Ajiro asks while kicking away some thugs. Itsuka questions the same while using her bow thrust and Sego no Ken, Fuji no Seikim, to cleave through groups of enemies. Jutero tightens his fists before hardening his resolve. Buy me some time. He shouts before bringing his right hand in front of his face, while the left rests parallel at his waist. He closes his eyes and concentrates. Ajiro and Itsuka both feel the surge of Kai gathering around him and understand what he was trying to do. I'll wake up Jiroda. See if you can get at her face to distract her. Itsuka calls out. The tailed boy agrees and climbs up a light first, and leapt along the side of a building to get at Mount Lady's face. He tries to use his flame tail dance to attack, but she easily evades and swats him away. And while she was certain that would knock him out of the fight, Ajiro keeps going and tries again and again. With Jutero he was pulling as much energy as he could as rapidly as possible. Damn, it won't be much since I'm only pulling what I can write in this moment. But if I put it all out, I think I can take her down. 
Chitaro thinks while pulling and focusing the storm or volcano within him. Since he can't move, some of the villains think they can take him down and ruin the student's chances. But Mirio keeps him covered with Ibera while the other first years keep Mount Lady busy. I'm not sure what you're doing, but you might want to hurry. Mirio shouts to Jutero. Itsuka meanwhile used a taser function on her gloves to wake up Jurota. Oh my head. Kendo, what is he starts but Itsuka cuts him off, saying, not a lot of time. We need to either take Mount Lady down or buy Jutero enough time to do it. She then switches to using some gadgets to try and keep the heroine off balance. While the nets aren't big enough to cover her, they still do provide some damage and shocks when wrapped around her, though only to her fingers or stuck to her shoulder. Explosives though do distract her and let Itsuka throw off some of the minor attackers going after Jutero. She's putting it all out there, and Jutero put his trust in us to keep him and the civilians safe. So I have to do everything I can, even if I don't understand how to really do it. With those thoughts, Ajiro's resolve hardens and he channels his Kai to use a strong Kai kick and then tail attack only to be shocked when the kick he was throwing to gain momentum, launches some Kai out and strikes Mount Lady in the eye. Gah, what the hell? She roars as she feels it impact and temporarily blind her. Ajiro catches himself and is shocked by what he did. He then smiles before focusing his Kai into his feet again, first to boost his jump and when at the right point he kicks once more, sending a fireball at his large opponent. It shocks her again and Ajiro keeps up this pattern, even experimenting and throwing not just one, but two and then three attacks from his kicks and tail. While that was happening, Jurota stepped in next to attack and disrupt the hero as well. And while she was more skilled and experienced, the beast boy did throw her off enough for Itsuka and Ajiro to get in more attacks. But Mount Lady catches on eventually. She noticed that Itsuka and Ajiro were constantly keeping on opposite sides of her, trying to divide her attentions while grappling with Jurota. Smart kids, I'm a big target, but that also means I've got a lot of defense. But like I said, I've gone back to the basics, and I can use your attacks against you. She waits until Ajiro throws another Kai shot, before flowing under an attack from Jurota. She rolls him over her shoulder and right into a shock net Itsuka had thrown. But she doesn't let him go and tosses the boy around to hit Ajiro, and finishing by tossing them both at Itsuka. Shit, Itsuka shouts while stopping her run, but she still gets squashed by her two classmates. Mount Lady is breathing a bit heavy and compliments the three for how they handled her. But it wasn't quite enough. Oh I wouldn't be so sure. After all, Jotaro says while keeping his hand still in front of his face. He opens his eyes and they are glowing with Kai. He smirks before saying, they all bought me enough time to end this. Unzen Sakuretsu. He then punches the ground with enough force that it cracks for blocks. Mount Lady assumed it didn't do anything, until she's blasted in the stomach by a huge rush of red, white, and blue energy, knocking her up into the air and rendering her unconscious. This shocks all of those watching, from the hero students and faux villains in the battleground, to the spectators in the observation room. They suddenly saw a person with no powers knock out a pro hero with a quirk that made them a giant and he still had energy to use. The faux villains threw their hands up and surrendered after that and the exercise was called to an end. The students in Ground Beta questioned exactly what it was that they did, and if it could be taught to others. Guess this shows that power doesn't just come from something you're born with. It can also be something you learn. Ajiro says with a proud look to his Kai mentor and fellow student of the art. The second year who doubted before rubbed the back of his head and apologized. I just, I never knew such things were possible. We've all gotten so used to quirks and how easy they make the idea of fighting that. He trailed off before Mirio finished his statement, noting, We've gotten used to the idea that those were a be-all end-all. Even with the gadgets, armor, and true meta powers, we still thought you needed an inborn power to really be strong. Another second year acknowledged they were wrong and congratulated the three on doing what they didn't have the right skills for. I mean heck, my quirk just gives me perfect spatial understanding. Great for knowing where everything and everyone is, but not the absolute best with fighting. In the observation room, some were whistling at the skills they saw and the sheer power Jotaro could put out even without his abilities as a true meta. Though the first years were groaning at the sight, remembering the pain Jotaro had inflicted on them. Man, even to power this guy is a monster, Yu says with a shake of her head. Izuku elbows her before asking her to take that back. Don't forget what he has to deal with every day when he is powered up. I don't think many of us could handle it the way he's learned to. The others from class want to nod and agree with Izuku's assessment. Yu is a bit surprised, but she smiles and compliments them on standing up for their friend. I'd say that's something we need more of when it comes to heroes, she says with a smile, thinking back on her support for Nejire and how ones like Mirio and Tamaki would reach out to her. The group then shifts their focus to the screen showing Ground Omega and the very dangerous challenge the students are facing there, that being a wildfire and evacuation of the civilians that had been camping. Tamaki gulped while looking at his fellow hero students and tried to not imagine all of them as food. Hamajiki Senpai, are you okay? Achako asked with a worried look. The pointy-eared teen groaned a bit before saying he'd be fine. I'm pretty sure I don't have the luxury of not being fine. To pay off this thought, the group heard screams and some explosions and could see smoke deeper in the training ground. Tamaki grimaced but took the lead into the air to scout things out. But he wasn't alone. 
Hopefully the others can worry about any faux civilians. We should get the lay of the land, Saffentite said while flying alongside the third year. He nodded and the two sped up to inspect the site, finding only a few villains causing trouble while the students were running. The main one's trouble coming from a villainous version of Burnin and a few other heat and fire heroes. Yes, we probably should have seen that coming. I'm going in first, Safi says while flying down with some magic in her hands. She throws the shots and some of them do impact, but something else surprises her. I wasn't sure that would work, but I guess my quirk can be used on even magic. A black bandaged version of Kaido says while using his bandages to redirect a few of Safi's spells. Well, he'll be trouble for us, and this fire is getting out of hand, Tamaki says while striking with his own quirk making a few tentacles manifest from his fingers to strike at some of the villains. Time to make some calamari. Burnin shouts before taking some clumps of hair and tossing it at Tamaki's fingers. The rest of the hero students arrive and work on evacuation and combat of the enemies before them. Shoto tries to take them out quickly with his ice, only to be stopped when he starts laughing uncontrollably. Eraser owes me for this. I'm not even from this area. The comedy hero Ms. Joke says before punching Shoto. A few other teens start laughing and it leaves them open to attacks, until Tsuyu and Achako step up and distract the hero pretending to be a villain, namely by Achako making a few boulders light and Tsuyu kicking them as hard as she could with her frog legs. Whoa, talk about rolling stones. Joe quips before getting blasted by some magic from Safi. Shoto catches his breath and thanks all of them for the save. Listen, you'll be a high priority target. You need to fall back a bit. Setsuna says while keeping her parts away from the fire and villains. Shoto agrees and suggests that he could work on evacuation with his ice. I'll make a pathway, and if some of it melts, it could help with the fire. Manga steps up next and uses his own quirk to make some moisture in the air, hoping it would help to put out the fire. Not a bad idea, but we need something else to really. Wait, Manga, can you make just water with your quirk? Saffentide asks with a creative gleam in her eyes, though she gets a bit close to the odd-headed boy. He blushes before saying, oh yeah, yeah I can. What do you have in mind? It'll just evaporate if I do it over the fire. Saffentite's smile grows a bit before asking him to make as much water as possible with it. Can't you just use your magic to make it go away? A third year question while using his quirk to move away some of the burning trees from the rest. A genie girl scowls and says, it doesn't work like that. I have to think of an effect or spell to make it happen. And some of them take a bit more time to activate. Saffentite creates a pair of copies and then they transform into a few vehicles. The main one being a large fire engine with a tank to hold a large amount of water. Oh I get it. Water. 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 Manga says with an exclamation mark on his face. The tank fills with the liquid while the doubles turn into machines as well. One being a helicopter that had a dump tank underneath. And the other being a plane to drop some quickly made extinguisher bombs. Hopefully this is enough. Saffentite says before her helicopter self takes to the air and dunks her dump bucket into the large tank. Oh wait. Before I forget, here Manga. This should keep your throat from drying out, the genie fire engine says while turning a hose into an arm making some bottles of water for the hero student. After he took a few more drinks, he made even more water to put in the tank, while the Saffentite doubles kept dumping water and extinguishing materials to contain the fire. A few of the less combat-capable students were given hoses from Safi's truck form and were spraying down the blaze as fast as possible. And when a few thugs, faux villains try to attack them, Saffentite surprises them once more by making more hoses to blast the enemies away. Don't think I'll make it that easy for you. She shouts before telling the other heroes to cover their ears, and then letting out a powerful directed horn blast disorienting their opponents. Man, this is a big help. Too bad we don't have more magic to work with, a horse-headed student says after retaking the hose. Shoto and a few others had just finished removing all of the students. So, the fire and ice user asked for his senior's help in making a backfire. If we can make sure it can't spread, we can limit the damage. But I need your help, he said while generating a flame in his right hand. A few of them nodded and used their quirks to dig up the brush or help keep the flame going in one direction. Others communicated with the main group of their plan. With that said, all of the hero students kept working non-stop to evacuate all of the civilians, put out the fires, and stop the villains, with Saffentite getting in some comedic attacks from her fire truck form. First by using the hoses to wrap up Kaido and then hose down both Burnin and Anima from a ladder hose. And when Ms. Joke tried to get her laughing, Safi turned it back on her by weaving a reflection spell, with Shoto getting a payback hidden when she deactivated her quirk. Before too long, the fires were manageable and all of the villains were captured. Hey, could you turn off whatever it is you did to reflect my quirk? It's kind of uncomfortable to have it being used on myself. Joke said with a pout. Hell no. If I do that, you could use your power to knock us out and then break free. Safi said in her truck form. But her caution was unfounded as the speakers called out that they were done and could leave the staging grounds. Ms. Joke gave Safi a look and the truck narrowed its eyes before rolling them and turning back into her normal form. And with a snap and did the spell around the green-haired pro. Gotta say, that was pretty clever. Never thought I could get Uno reverse like that. 
just seemed like a good way to deal with some dangerous powers, especially one like yours that could make us laugh until we pass out, Safi says with a shrug. The pros and quite a few of the upperclassmen complimented the genie girl for her combinations and planning. On the way back a few asked what else she could do or create with her magic, given they knew nothing at all pertaining to magic or that it was even a potential for heroes. Hey I gotta wonder, what if you had a kid? Would they be a half-genie or something else? Maybe you could make a half-genie hero or something. When one of the male members said this, Safentite scowled at him. And then Tamaki wrapped him up with his tentacles. Not cool and kind of creepy pal, he said before apologizing to Safentite, who smiled and thanked him for the apology. Frankly, it's not the first time someone has. Come on to me. Safentite started before turning her head away, following something strange she sensed. What is this I'm feeling? She thought before hearing a new alert sent out over the campus. An unplanned accident had occurred in Ground Gamma with a strange gas explosion. The teacher sent out a message for any help from pros to the students to aid in this crisis. What the heck happened? Setsuna questioned before running to the pipe-laden battleground. No POV. Mina looked down at her hands as she walked with her group toward Ground Gamma. She smiled a bit to herself while thinking back on a few other training exercises in the machinery and pipe-filled grounds. That little race after the internships. Skated as fast as I could, but I couldn't outpace Ida's legs or Ajiro's tail agility. Meanwhile, Jotaro, Midori, and Safi competed by themselves. Though Safi had a special rule thrown on to make sure she couldn't teleport a fly quite the same. Then there was. Everything okay there? A taller third year asked her. Apparently had a size increase type of power, but even without an active he was about seven feet tall. He seemed like a rhino given the skin, but that wasn't his quirk. Mina shook her head and said, just thinking about some other exercises we've done here. Kinda wondering what they have in mind for us. The upperclassmen nodded and wondered if it would be some kind of disaster. That's likely. I'm more worried that we don't know enough about each other's abilities. Or equipment like what that kendo girl used. That had to be some kind of holo or energy weapon attack right. A second year asked. Monoma stepped up and berated the older student a bit for assuming that it was technology alone. That is the product of the hard work and dedication that all of us from 1B show. Even if she did need to learn it from the damn wall of meat he grumbled that last part. But the grumble turned to a yelp when Mina stomped on his foot before glaring at him slightly. You kind of asked for that dude, Sin said with a raised eyebrow. Takoyami chuckled and thanked Mina for doing that. But if you wish to know how they did that, Kendo and Ajiro have been training with Chutero to learn an art we all believe to be nothing but a fantasy. They control Kai, the bird-headed boy said while walking up to the industrial ground. A large student and a few others stopped at that before hurriedly questioning if it was true. Yeah, apparently, he learned the basics of Kai when he was on some crazy journey. And it helped him to get control of his super strength. Koda said with a nervous smile. So, those energy beams and that huge ball Kendo used. That was all Kai. And she just trained to be able to use it. A shocked female third year asked with a tilt of her head. Ring confirmed the statement and noted how much they had been training. The big third year shook his head and chuckled before saying, That's crazy. But then again, that Jotaro guy is all kinds of crazy alone. A few others agree before they hear sirens ringing out through the battleground. And see a few buildings look like they are sinking into the ground. Let's move. The big student says before sizing up a bit to get a better view of the trouble. A few others who have agility enhancing powers or similar speed boosting powers go ahead to help some of the victims. And they come upon a few students who were dressed up like construction or office workers. Hey, come on. Let's get you out of here. A few say. They help the injured as best they can. Some using healing quirks for quick triage. There are more inside. I think the largest number of students were sent here. One gen ed student says with worry. This make more of the hero students worried, but they put it aside to move into the main collapsing buildings. The one with about 70 students inside were grumbling or panicking. One of the grumbling students was Bakugo Katsuki. Damn it, I can get us out of here just fine. I'm more of a hero than those who are in the hero course. He says while sparking some small explosions in his hand. But he gets stopped by a chop atop his head from Egoyamato Tsutsutaka. If you do that, you could set something worse off or do more damage. This isn't a fight with a villain. It's a rescue situation. And while Bakugo is ready to rage at him and strike back, a bigger part of him acknowledges that he was right. Was this some of what Deku understood more? That rescue is more important than showing off or using your power to beat the villain. He thought before noticing that a few others had been trapped. His first impulse to was blast away the debris, but he got chopped again and told to lift the pipes. Outside though, the recon specialists couldn't get an absolute read on all of the danger. There's too much interference. I can't get the best read. Gyro exclaimed with her jacks plugged into the building. A few others who had enhanced senses said the same. Damn, then we'll have to move on our best guesses. Five of you go into that building. I want four more to come with me. The large third year's order was followed and they started in. Sen and Monoma went with a trio of upperclassmen. Monoma having copied the enlarging student's quirk for just in case, and eventually found himself needing it as there were a few places they needed to lift debris. They eventually found about 20 students trapped throughout the complex, and it was at this time that Monoma got to be the big hero. As they were coming out of the building, a large amount of debris fell down. 
Before it could fall though, Monoma went to the maximum he could grow to hold the ceiling in place. Go, I'll hold this as long as I, no. He shouted before feeling the power start to fade a bit. Sen and the others moved around him quickly, but they could tell he was shrinking. No way, this is my time in the spotlight. I'm not just a side character or a stage a hand. This time, I'm the one saving them all. He shouts as he pushes past what he felt was his limit to holding a quirk and stood like a tree while holding the ceiling up. Sen was shocked and congratulated his classmate before saying they'd be back as fast as they could. Monoma lasted long enough that all of the students they were trapped with could get out, finally feeling the strain and starting to pass out as his quirk gave out. But he was saved by a few others who came back or came to help, one of them being Rin, who with Koda stabilized the ceiling while Sen helped to get Monoma out of the danger zone and once out in the sun he saw quite a few cheering for him and congratulating him on his determination, bringing a genuine smile to his face. Mina meanwhile was with Set and Larger, and they all quickly found that they had the unlucky state to have the largest number. You've gotta be kidding me. We've got that many in here. One second year asked. The third year gave him a look before telling his underclassmen to get focused. He's right. I'll look around in some other rooms to clear the way, Mina said before skating off. And while the second and third years wanted to go with her, the lead member had one go back up to get more help. Eventually they got five more hero students inside that could help with recovery and rescue. Mina acting as a guide to a few of the trapped students she had partially rescued. I didn't want to dissolve away the entire wall in case it could cause more of a collapse. The elder students agreed with her and helped to stabilize the rest of the openings she had made. A few had started to get out but more of the rubble was coming down and they needed to get the victims out. With Bakugo grumbling at having to be rescued. Within the building, manless potions were bubbling and brewing into their final state. And it was time to show what the brew had become. All of a sudden, a mass of purple and pink clouds filled the building, and almost 80 students were caught in the wake of it. While the hero students tried to cover or stop it or protect the civilians, the gas moved too quickly and all around them, almost as though it had a will of its own. Everyone started coughing and collapsing from the fumes as they tried to move to the exit. Upon realizing that there was an unknown factor to the exercise, the function that was causing the faux building to collapse stopped. What's going on? Nezu shouted while looking at the cameras. I don't know sir. There's some sort of gas or vapor filling the building we had filled for the exercise. Power Loader reported while trying to get some of the cameras up and running. He called an end to the exercise and told the students outside to get away from the building. Thirteen and a multitude of other rescue heroes were called in, but it would still take them a few minutes to get there. Even Toshinori or Hibiki couldn't help as he was out of country, while Padre Pedro was in a different prefecture helping set up some shelters. Lousy timing for when I take some personal days. Toshinori thought to himself as he got the call while in India visiting an international colleague. He was sprinting as fast as he could muster without causing damage to the area. Back in the building, everyone was having various reactions to the gas that was filling the room. Some seemed to be melting or their bodies were becoming like clay. Others suddenly had new aspects to their quirks that was causing more damage. Like Bakugo, whose nitroglycerin sweat was suddenly exploding without his command, and setting his head on fire. The enlarging student meanwhile started turning into what looked like an actual rhino. Others found that they couldn't use their quirks at all. Though there was one exception. Mina was mostly unaffected other than just being off-put by the smell from the gas and not being able to see. I have coughed yet. Everyone out. She thinks aloud. One of the older students told her to stop and wait for more help. You can't do enough with your quirk. And we're on our own here. I don't think this is part of the drill so we should just wait for the pros. Hearing all of that, Mina started to understand a bit more of Jutero and Safentite's frustration with the world of pro heroes. She tightened her fist before saying, We don't have that luxury and frankly who cares if this was originally a drill. We're planning to be heroes, and we have to put everything out to save others, even if it seems hopeless or we don't have the best powers to do the job. Before anyone could stop her, Mina took off for the entry point they came in earlier, using everything she had to melt through the rubble. But she adjusted some of the solubility to where it could act as a glue to hold some of the rubble in place. Between that and the constant need to dissolve and then glue the rubble together starts to take its toll. Namely, she's no longer able to resist the corrosive effects of her own powers. What's more, she is starting to feel lightheaded and dazed. I thought the stuff didn't affect me, but I guess it's just slow absorbing. That or my acid acted as a defense. And now that I'm using up a lot, I can't keep myself safe, she says while wobbling a bit toward her next section to burn. She stumbles a bit more before thinking back on some of the ones who have inspired her to keep going, as well as remembering where she started and what she is trying to prevent again. This wouldn't slow down Kiri. He'd push on with his own manliness to save everyone. Midori wouldn't let the fact it was unstable stop him from going in to save people. He'd probably be helping me melt stuff to get out while trying to figure out what this mist is. Could use Safi's magic though. It would make getting out of here easy. But even if she couldn't use that, she'd still try to find a way. In Jotaro, Nina trailed off while thinking of him. She thought about the way he showed her more of the reality of being a hero. How he'd helped her and really guided her while trying to learn Kapoeira. Not to mention helping Itsuka and others grow as fighters or improve their skills using their powers with Izuku. 
even without his power. He doesn't quit. He's not backing down just because people say he should wait or let his power recharge. He'd do anything he could to get us all out of here. Cough, heck so. I have to do the same. Mina finally reaches the window to get out of the building and starts dissolving the rubble that had fallen to block the way, not realizing that she was burning through other things as well. She coughed a few more times before she could really see daylight, smiling as she broke through and out of the building, and right into Safentite's arms. Safi, how? Oh, I'm going to take a nap now. Mina says as Jotaro and Izuku run up next, each looking at her in worry. She smiled at all three of them before noticing their blushes. Why are you all staring? It's not like I'm naked or anything. Mina says as she passes out while Safentite moves her over to the side. Though Mina was wrong. She was indeed naked as the acid proofing of her costume had been burned away and so had the costume. Safentite covered her up before going with Izuku and Jotaro to assess some of the trouble. What is this cloud? Izuku asked while covering his mouth with his own mask. Jotaro shrugged and questioned what this should do. Unfortunately, I don't think we can do much now. Even with my mask I don't know what other effects or ways this stuff could infect us is. Izuku said while looking the building over. Safentite was considering much the same, but something else was bothering her. What is this feeling? I know I felt something similar before but... It was different, she thought before considering changing into a fan or something to pull the cloud of gas out. Don't, or rather don't just disperse it into the atmosphere. Izuku said before questioning if she could contain the gas. Safentite nodded and transformed into an industrial air vacuum pump and ventilation tubes that snaked through the building. She couldn't go far but she didn't have to as 13 had arrived. Where are you? You know what? I don't care. Miss Anwar, keep doing what you're doing. I'll get some of the rest. She said before having another hero open a window for her to use her black hole. Melissa had come as well and launched a few probes to gather details on the interior. Okay, we should be in a decent spot to go in after the others. She announced after a few minutes, turning her partial mask into a full helmet to go down and help with rescue. And while the pros wanted her to stay back, the fact that she didn't have a quirk put her in a gray area to help without any approval. The same was said of Jotaro and Izuku, who were each given enhanced air masks by Melissa. Fine, the extra help isn't a bad thing anyway. One hero relented with a groan. They each got some special masks to help protect against whatever the gas was, and they went in to save the students from what they assumed was an exercise gone wrong, only to be shocked at the state quite a few of the students were in, from some looking like sentient puddles of, well themselves, or others turning into mutated monsters that seemed barely able to think. Luckily they were relatively easily dealt with, thanks to the third year who, despite having been changed into a bit of a monster himself, was able to fight and restrain some of the others. He couldn't speak very coherently, but he was able to mind where to go. Kekum. Izuku said upon finding his former friend in a room far from the others. He was badly burned and looked to have multiple broken bones. Even the fire that was normally burning in his eyes had gone out. He barely acknowledged Izuku with a Deku before passing out again. Izuku hurried over and helped to get the boy out of the building. All of the heroes did the same and moved many of them into one of the gyms, turning it into a makeshift medical plague ward. Recovery girl herself had to call in multiple other doctors to help with treating all of the students. This is a disaster. How did this happen? Any idea what that gas was that caused this? No, the media will have a field day with this. The pro heroes were talking amongst themselves as they looked on. Nezu heard it all and agreed with them while trying to piece together who could have done this. You think this was an attack not an accident? Present Mike said with confusion. Nezu nodded before stating that, the effects. The choice of location. The fact it was students who were affected and probably targeted. This isn't a coincidence. And while he wanted to keep this secret, within a day it was all over the news. And made worse by a special declaration. I hope you all like the little gift we left you heroes, and so much for your security and promises to watch over the people in your walls. You failed and now there are others who have been caught up in a disaster, all because you believed yourselves untouchable. You were wrong. A viral video of Shigaraki Tamura had been playing non-stop for over a day, with him, the LOV, and the forgotten claiming responsibility. Power Loader checked later and found the source of the attack. It seems something else got hidden in the parts we had stored there during the school festival. We're just lucky this didn't happen during that. Saying that makes Nezu start to ponder on how they got whatever caused this incident into the school. I believe I might have an idea sir, a new voice said at the conference room. It was Miss Un who looked to have an unsettled look on her face. She cleared her throat before saying, We've been using a company for years that has. While the packing material is very similar to what the villain compresses quirk can make. I looked into it, and before your parts were supposed to be shipped it seems they broke into the factory. Her assistant nods and shows a video of them sneaking into the packing plant. Both look ashamed and apologize that they had a role to play in this, even if it was unintentional, so Nezu thanked them before they left. Then, talk about crappy coincidences. A little too coincidental. This isn't the first time one of Miss Un's businesses has been involved with us, Nezu says with suspicion. Unfortunately, he can't act on it and he has no proof. With Un and Shido or rather with Sasaku and Tamura, they were laughing in the limo as they headed back to the penthouse. Did you see their faces when we volunteered that data? Oh it was great, Tamura said before toasting with some champagne. A toast Natalie happily returned. 
In the few days after the incident, almost none of the students were getting better. Some like the third year could at least still think straight, but barely. The only one who had been caught in the disaster and seemed fine was Mina. Recovery girl wondered if the pink student had something in her blood that made her immune. So she took some samples before allowing her to return to her class and dorm, where she was greeted by hugs and congratulations from her classmates. You were so manly as Shido. Are you sure you're okay? Is it true that these three got to see you naked? Mina was a bit overwhelmed by the questions but she was saved. Safentite turned into a bullhorn and let out a squelch to distract everyone. How about we let her breathe? Her fellow members of Wana cleared their throats and stepped away while still congratulating the girl. Safentite was the first to go over and pat her on the shoulder. I'm glad you're safe. And hopefully, we can put this behind us all, the genie girl said with a smile. She hugged Mina, before asking the others to take it easy on the girl for the time being. Izuku and Jotaro came next and they both said they were impressed on how hard she pushed. You did everything you could to get an opening for the others. You are a true hero, Izuku said with a smile and blush. Jotaro agreed and told her that he was proud of what she did. But don't go too overboard again. We need to all be in top shape to deal with the ones who did this, he said with a smile and slight sparkle in his green hazel eyes. Or at least it looked like a sparkle to Mina. She had been blushing the entire time they had been talking, and for a bit when the others hugged her. While she had been feeling fine, she now noted that she felt a little warm and fuzzy inside. And it was not helped by the hug Safentai gave her, the look and praise Izuku shot her way, and Jotaro saying he was proud and giving her a gentle hug. Uh, thanks guys. Look I uh, I, I could use some sleep. And in my own bed. So I'm gonna call it a night, she said while trying to cover up her blush. The others agreed and told her to sleep well and rest up for whatever came next. The only problem was, she couldn't get any rest. While it was somewhat cool in her room, she felt so heated she couldn't get a decent night's sleep. Oh come on, why is it so hot in here? And why do I keep seeing? No get those thoughts out of my head. She thought aloud. She tensed up before curling into a ball to try and put her thoughts aside. Only to notice her sleep shorts feeling funny for some reason. She reached down her body and could feel how wet her shorts and underwear were. She bit her lip before subtly slipping them off to try and relieve some of the heat she felt. All while a number of her friends' faces ran through her head. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Deku mastered OFA and his own quirk I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout out to Han Baron for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Deku Fanfic for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.